Over in the uh, World Wrestling Entertainment, uh, a new show is premiering on USA Network called uh, Primetime Wrestling. Rita Marie becomes the world's first female referee. A ringside, f a ringside fan turned wrestler, Hillbilly Jim, is about to hop in the ring and make a splash. A muddy splash, uh, nonetheless. Uh, Barry Wynn and Mike Rotundo win the tag titles from Adonis and Murdoch, but in Jim Crockett Promotions, my guest uh, here was a newcomer coming in, taking the promotion by storm. He's beating opponents in mere seconds with the uh, belly to belly. And uh, by year's end, he will have won multiple championships. You do remember 1985, right? That's the question I always have to preface to my guests when we're talking about the 80s. Yeah, yes. 80s very, were a little very, wild. Very, very well. Okay. Too much, probably. <laughs> Magnum TA is with me. Thank you very much for agreeing to go on the journey back in time. And we will start. Actually, we should probably start with just an overall picture of the lay of the land in JCP in 1985. Um, You'd left uh, Watts's territory. Um, was there a noticeable difference upon first coming in between the two promotions? It it was a uh, it was a gamble for me. I did it basically out of faith and belief in my friend Dusty Rhodes, who was the booker, uh, of what an opportunity there was in the Crockett organization. Uh, Bill's territory was on fire. We were yeah. selling out. You know, pretty much every night, uh, I, I had leaped into my first uh, six-figure income year, and uh, you, you know, and it was the pinnacle of my success at that time. Uh, on the other hand, the Crockett promotion uh, was was not doing so well. They had lost uh, their top babyface at the time they that they were culturing was Barry Windham, and he had left, uh, not seeing that things were going to turn around as quickly as he would have liked to. He left and went to New York, mm -hmm. and, and Dusty called me uh, really broken that because uh, we were very close friends besides working together, that Barry had left and, and, and uh, told me that if I came that he would give me you know, the opportunity of a lifetime. And because I came from the uh, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake area of Virginia, and I'd grown up, you know, cutting my teeth watching Mid Atlantic Wrestling. My dream had always been to be able to come back home uh, in a you know main event type capacity, and uh, you know wrestle you know in the arenas that I grew up watching them in myself. So, you know, we we uh, you know took a big gamble. You mm -hmm. know, I say we, my family, mm -hmm. just everybody involved in the thought processing of leaving a very successful place to go with the promise of. Uh, you can have, you know, the sky's a limit and what you'll have for an opportunity. And uh, I did, and I worked out a six-week uh, notice for Bill and took care of business for everybody on the way out. What like, was his reaction? Uh, Bill's reaction was that I was foolish because, you know, I was his top baby face. Yeah. And uh, we were on fire, and I could have stayed there. And, you know, JYD was gone, and uh, Jim Duggan was there, but he wasn't that kind of baby face. And, and I had a real strong position with this company. But uh, we had, we'd had we have a meeting every week at the uh, Irish McNeil Boys Center where we, we uh, did our TV and, and, and when Bill always addressed the, the team. And I mean, I had to listen to it for six weeks about, you know, you know I can't believe Magnum's <laughs> going off to, you know, the Carolinas, you know, they're just, you know, because the guys there were making, you know, three, four hundred dollars a week and, and I'm making two thousand dollars a week. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a big gamble, but uh, and I was the first one to brave my way out and go do this. But it was like I was the Pied Piper. Once I got out there and things started going, and we turned the corner and we got on Turner Broadcasting uh, Systems you know, TV, uh, you know everything turned around and slowly but surely every single one of them followed me out. Anyone on the homestead questioning the decision to walk away from two thousand dollars a week? Uh, y you know. I was a big dreamer, and and it was hard to step on my dreams back then. I mean, okay. I I believed if I believed it, I could achieve it, I could do it, you know. And and uh, so you know, I I didn't look at the downside of it, okay. because really to me, I, I was the commodity. And if the commodity didn't work, I you know I would have gone somewhere else. Right. Uh, so you know, it was what it was, but it was a gamble. The 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 environment, let's say, uh, in a Watts locker room versus uh, a Crockett locker room. A difference, not a difference? 
very tense at Mid South, particularly if Bill was there. I mean, uh, I mean, we had, you know, we had Grizzly there was an agent, and, and everybody was like under. It was like road race 2000 to get to the matches every night because if you got there late, you were gonna get a you were gonna get fined fifty dollars or whatever it was. And and I, and I did manage to be there for a year and a half and never got a fine. That's, that's and pretty, the drives were brutal. Yeah, I the mean, drives the were brutal, and, and there was a lot of bad accidents in that territory, and and uh, a lot of bad things happened uh, there on the road because there were it was bad roads. We all lived in uh, in Alexandria, Louisiana, and we but we covered such a vast area. Everything was like 250 miles each way. And, and a lot of that driving was on two-lane roads right. and rural-type two-lane roads, and it was uh, it was a brutal place to travel. But to answer your question about the locker room mm -hmm. atmosphere, being in Mid South was more like being in a in a military-type organization, very much uh, Bill, very much an A-type personality, would get up in people's faces with his passion to try to make them be better, and and bring out you know, some tremendous performances out of people that didn't even know they were capable of doing it. So for me, I always, I always refer to that part of my wrestling career like going to graduate school. I felt like mm -hmm. I'd laid the foundation in other places to, to be, be open to going there, but he put the polish on, on you. If you had that capability, he could bring it out. Now, Jim Crockett Jr., on the other hand, was? A businessman, uh, a, a very pleasant, guy to be around. He enjoyed the business, a fan of the business. I'm sure grew up, you know, with his father and watching the business. And and uh, J uh, Jimmy was the kind of guy that was kind of, it was like he was embarrassed to be in front of the camera. He would do it if Dusty made him do it. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he didn't have the ego that wanted to be, you know, out there in the public eye. Now, he had the ego to want to have a very successful business. And uh, you know, he ra he rode that meteoric ride we had to the top, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before it all crashed and burned later. But uh, he, he was a totally, totally different type of person, and Jimmy never lied to me. Uh, he he, t he told me straight up. Uh, he got on the phone with me the night I made the decision and said, Magnum, he said, I can't guarantee the kind of money you're making now. He said, but I promise you, your very worst week will never be less than $700 a week. And uh, and I would give you, you know, the 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 keys to the city basically and and you, you got the opportunity to be the best that you could be so with that and with Dusty's backing mm -hmm. you know and and knowing Flair's ties there and everything it was kind of a, a no-brainer for me to do it but it was uh, it was a completely different you know more relaxed atmosphere we were much more passionate about the creativity part of it than some of the physical execution that Bill was as far as the hard-hitting realistic you know painting the picture of the uh, of the you know, almost uh, competitive uh, amateur style along with the professional moves and everything, of course, but he wanted to, to, to be a hard-hitting sport. And when we, we still brought that intensity in the Carolinas and in, in uh, the Mid-Atlantic, but we were, Dusty's imagination knew no end. He, he, would, we, he would think up things in the car and go back and sell them to Jimmy and kick them around with JJ and Tully and you know uh, Rick and you know had a lot of people around to kick these ideas around with and it was that creativity part that was existing there and I say there in the Mid Atlantic mm -hmm. that 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 wasn't a, a culture cultural part of what happened in Mid South even though Bill Dundee had brought a lot of that from when he came to Tennessee, mm -hmm. from Tennessee over as the Booker. He brought a lot of colorful things, but it was a different style. It was a, so far over the top, it's almost what we would call hot shot in the territory yeah. today. Too much. Yeah, a little yeah. too much. Ronald Reagan was in the White House. Uh, the Miami Dolphins and San Francisco 49ers were headed to Super Bowl 19 like a virgin by Madonna, was number one on the radio. The average American house, your average household American, uh, hello? The average American household income, $23,618 a year, and a gallon of gas set you back $1.20.
And this guy was holding Intercontinental Gold and would soon be holding Tag Team Gold. And uh, thank you for allowing us to take you back to the 80s, as much of it as you remember. Sure. I know a lot of your compatriots in the business will proudly say the 80s were a blur. We'll see how much <laughs> of that is the case here today. Um, my first question for you is where Jack Reynolds emerged from. Cleveland, Ohio. He was, uh, <clears throat> I remember in the 70s, he was, uh, Johnny Powers had the, the Buffalo, Cleveland territory, uh. and Cleveland Television, uh, he was the main announcer, Jack Reynolds, NWF it was called. So he was always a wrestling guy, he wasn't? Well, he was a TV guy, I think he did. Baseball and other oh, okay. things right. like that, too. Um, uh, we see Jesse Ventura um, doing the uh, doing the show with him. What are your thoughts on having the heel commentator um, role? Well, I, I love Jesse Ventura's job. I really did. And uh, he always stuck up for the bad guys, the heels. And uh, I always liked what he said about me. And, and you know, he kind of made the show run right along the way it should have, and, and it was not just a heel point of view, but it was a wrestler's point of view, too. Jack was in there years ago with Lanza, um, and I had just left Jack in Charlotte. He had a great run down there. I. Um, I really think they, they wanted to uh, put him against Andre the Giant. I don't know if that ever happened. But then they did have, remember the Machines? Yeah, sure. He was part of that. Uh, I think it was uh, Andre in a mask and Jack, mm -hmm. uh, Jack Mulligan in a mask. And Bill Eadie, right? The three of them. And Bill Eadie, yeah. yeah. Um, th these tapings, these B-show tapings are now uh, Brantford, Ontario? London Gardens, I'm sorry. London Gardens. No, it was Brantford. Was it Brantford? Yes, oh, it was. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But they, uh, how did they land there? I mean, they, they, the, their staple was in the Northeast, so you see them running Allentown and, and, and Hamburg, but... Well, I think because Allentown was so out of the way from New York City, they could do a lot, a lot out there and virtually do anything they want. Brantford was out away from Hamilton because they had Channel 11 there. They used to do wrestling, excuse me, Channel 11 for the um, Toronto television. But I think they moved it out there to Brantford just because it was away from everybody and they could do what they wanted to. Did you guys mind traveling up that far for the weekly? I hated it. Yeah. Yeah. I hated it. I hate Canada. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, hey, you hate it, you hate it. Geographically, Brantford now, is it is it Western Canada? Is it above New York? Where am I? I don't know. It's, it's Western Ontario. It's between, it is, be I heard you mention London. It's between Hamilton, Ontario, and London. So it's right in between. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember the Battle Royal of which I speak? I do, and you know, I, my my natural foe, you know, coming in was Wahoo McDaniel's to begin with because they wanted me to focus on the U.S. title, which meant a lot in the NWA back in the day. That was the the stepping stone to the world title. That made you the number one contender, basically, to the world title. And Wahoo was such a mainstay in in the Mid Atlantic. I mean, he was amazing. He'd been back in the battles with Johnny Valentine mm -hmm. and. And, and uh, you know, a legend. So for me to put my focus on him, and it was kind of a unique thing to do, too, because Wahoo wasn't like a hated, cowardly type heel. You know, he was, you know, a giant buddy Hackett to me. I mean, I love Wahoo. I mean, he was a rough, tough, rugged son of a gun. But you didn't look at him like a cowardly heel to hate. And there was a lot of people that would still want to cheer for Wahoo. So, you know, to come in and call out Wahoo and go after him, it was a... It was a different kind of battle. It was really a battle of earning everyone's respect to to 
to paint myself the picture that I even deserve to be on the same hallowed ground that has been laid before me with men like Wahoo mm -hmm. McDaniels and Ricky Steamboat and guys who carry that U.S. title. And it established me in the market and in the territory as being a real fighting competitor that I would go up head to head with this, you know, the tougher the nails, Wahoo McDaniels. Yeah. And, and yes, yeah, so, so we painted the picture in the battle roles that, you know, I could overcome him if given the right opportunity and, to, and unseat him from the U.S. title. And, and that's what the battle roles were designed to do. Now, those big $50,000 battle royals, I want you to, uh, don't burst our bubble here. Did you get the $50,000 check in addition to your salary at the end of the night? No, it, it was kind of embarrassing because my family, my grandfathers in particular, were huge fans, huge uh -huh. fans. And I won not one of these, but quite a few of these. Mm -hmm. And I had to tell my grandfather that, that I was having to help out with the promotion a little bit. I was having to, I was having to kind of front him a little bit because, uh, you know, here I am, you know, I'm struggling, you know, to, you know, I mean, I mean just make it, just had my first six in, uh, figure income year and there I come over to here and they're acting like I'm hitting it out of the park, man. I'm having $50,000 months, let alone a hundred thousand dollars a year. And, and to answer your question, no, of course not. That was, you know, that was the carrot. That was the facade and, and, uh, you know, it didn't really happen, but it made for a really good story. Um, you come in and, and you're going to, it's very clear you're going to be pushed to the moon. Uh, is there any resentment from anyone in the locker room that someone coming, someone who maybe was there for a longer tenure and you're getting a lot of attention now? If there was, they kept it to themselves. Okay. You know, they may have, but anybody that knew the baptism of fire you come through and Bill Watts, and knows that you've gone through a year and a half of that kind of scrutiny every day and that kind of guidance every day, and you've been out there going 30 minutes and 45 minutes with like Butch Reeds and, and uh, Ted DiBiase's and, and really good talent and been working on top and been drawing big money, couldn't say but so much about it because it, you know, it kind of is what it is. I mean, uh, if they could have done it without me, I wouldn't have come. I'd have stayed where I was, and I'd probably ended up in the WWE myself. Right. Uh, but it, I think everybody back then was kind of glad just to see the territory take an upturn. And regardless of who it was, because, I mean, Steamboat was still there when I first got yeah. there. And, of course, Steamboat, one of the best workers in the history of the, of the industry as far as I'm concerned. But he had lost his his uh, momentum as that star baby face at that time to be able to draw uh, the big houses, so they were they were ready for something new, and uh, and he of course went on to the WWE, uh, you know, on his way out. But there was, you know, everybody was very supportive. Don okay. Canoodle and, and the, the, the the different guys there, and, and and Wahoo. I mean, here's a guy that's the legend, you know, and and, and he, the one that eventually passed the torch to me. So I would say no, the the uh, the team camaraderie that that particular group had was second to none. I thought he was really great when he was with uh, Haku, or I think it was King Haku. They had a great tag team. Uh, he was a real nice young kid, had a lot, a lot of talent, like most Samoans, they're just naturally uh, good wrestlers. Uh, over the years, he put on a lot of pounds, but still a, a real nice fellow, and I worked a couple of independents not too, too long ago for the guy. But back then, when they were, I think they were putting him with Jimmy Snuka, back then as his cousin, and uh, he begins to no-show and then he leaves. Was he problematic at all? Or was there some that, that, you know, the political part of it where he didn't show up and stuff like that. I. I really didn't pay attention to it because I was just, you know, mainly focused on what I was doing. But there was a, I mean, there was a lot of guys that <laughs> that uh, no show for one reason or another, missing an airplane, uh, uh, staying up partying all night, and missing the shows. I remember one time, not to be a name dropper, but the late great uh, Hercules was in a main event against Hogan in Chicago, and he went to Seattle instead. Uh, but it was kind of the office's fault because they gave him a ticket to go to Seattle, 
And uh, but I did the same thing myself. Uh, they sent me some tickets to go somewhere, and then early in the morning I must have woke up with a hangover, and they go, "Oh, by the way, those tickets are. Don't pay attention. You're booked in this town." And instead, I went to the original right. one, and then I got all kinds of heat. But I didn't remember the phone call, you know. So. <laughs> It's the 80s. To the best of us. The 80s. Yeah. Talk about the baby doll character and the pairing of her with Tully. Was it a good fit? It was a great fit. And it was Tully's idea. Because he could have gone, I mean, they could have pulled some supermodel out of the hat who really was a perfect 10. But see, Tully wanted he didn't want to be a baby face he wanted to be the best heel in the country he wanted to be hated he wanted to be despised he wanted to stir people's emotions and he knew that if he called this woman a perfect 10 who was six foot two and 220 pounds regardless of whether she had an attractive face or not that he was gonna stir the pot and and he did and it was uh, it was it was a brilliant strategy because you know at that time you know, Tully hadn't really taken off as a singles character, and not because he couldn't talk. Tully could talk as good as anybody that ever had a mic put in front of their face. He just needed something else to spice it up, and she spiced it up. Right. Uh, how was she behind the scenes? You know, honestly, I didn't spend a lot of time around Nicola behind the scenes because, you know, first of all, we were all separated, and, and we didn't share dressing rooms, right. particularly with the female side. So, you know, unfortunately, she, you know, well, <laughs> well, I, you know, it depends on how you look at that one. But, but anyway, you know, I, I didn't really, I, I know that she was very green when she came in. I'll never forget Tully it, it, and I were working one time early on, I think before we ever even really got into the hot angle. And he had me hooked, he told Baby Doll to hit me. <laughs> and she hit me. And I, I came out of that thing and I looked at him and I said, that is never going to happen again. <laughs> She hit me as hard as any man has ever hit me on the planet. And she just didn't know how to throw a, prun right. a punch, you know. But she was a big, strong yeah. girl. I mean, she was a true athlete just because she was large frame and stature. I mean, she was an athlete. And, uh, uh, you know, she, she, her learning curve was linear uh, during her, you know, days here. So she was, yeah, she made a big difference. Yeah, I was shocked because Eddie Graham was, uh, I really liked him in the early 70s, Jack Briscoe, late great Jack Briscoe now, brought me into that area. Um, I was dying to get out of Canada. And Eddie Graham was always very, very, I don't, you know, he was a good friend of my, of my father's, Johnny Valentine, but I think he, he, um, he really took an interest in a lot of the young talent. And, he would just go over and go over and go over stuff with you, and he was a smart guy. He really knew the wrestling business. I, I thought he was a great guy. I still haven't heard the real reason. I heard it was financial, but or that, that you know, the, the most obvious was that uh, WWF was coming in or taking over Florida, but I don't think that's why he, he took himself out. It was something to do with... Uh, some kind of a land deal or some kind of some heavy money deal and it was awful. A lot of the guys in the locker room with you in WWE at the time in 1985 had worked with Eddie. Do you remember the reaction uh, of all the boys at the time? Oh, every, everybody was shocked and I know my dad was shocked and you know it, it just uh, and, and it was horrific. What I heard was he shot himself once and he missed and I went out the side of his head, and and he shot himself twice to take himself out. So that's that's awful. Wow. Uh, Vince McMahon uh, was also close to the, the the two families. Were the, the McMahons and the Grams had a long-standing working relationship. Do you remember Vince's reaction? Um, did he share any of that with you guys? This was '85, right? Yeah. I always had a good relationship with with the kid Vince. Mm -hmm. uh, not his his dad mainly. I had a great relationship, but I had a good relationship with his son too. But after his father passed away, and uh, 
he kind of took over the helm, or did take over the helm, of everything. He was kind of hard to get to. Huh. Do you remember a locker room reaction? I'm sure many of the guys there had passed through. <sighs> well, I don't remember a locker room reaction, but I was at, Dick Slater and I were together watching the Super Bowl. It was Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, okay. And we got the call right then. And it was devastating because uh, for me, uh, Mike, Mike Graham had brought me to Florida uh, and, and discovered me in San Antonio, Texas, and brought me to uh, work with them in Florida. And I had spent, I was there for a year and a half, and I used to fly with Eddie and Mike on this private plane, you know, sometimes five days a week because, you know, Mike and him did, and Mike and I were buddying around. And I would sit with Eddie and just listen to him talk for hours and hours about psychology. And I'd watch the matches with him, and he would sit and talk about the psychology, the psychology. And I, I, I learned more about the whys and what fors and what works, what doesn't work, the difference in selling something and res registering something and dying where there's no chance of you making a comeback. He, he taught me so much young, just three years into the business, that uh, it, was, it was just an honor. And to hear that, you know, that life had just overwhelmed him yeah. to the point that he couldn't go on was almost unfathomable to me because to me he was like John Wayne. I just couldn't imagine that there was a there was no quit in in his persona that I'd ever perceived, and obviously he hid that very well. But uh, yeah, it it was devastating, and I know to Dusty that was like losing his dad again, yeah. because uh, Eddie just you know really really nurtured Dusty and and and, and watched him flourish. So it, it was a huge uh, impact. Well, I know that she was, I think, somewhere around Albany, New York, she was from. I remember um, thinking, why, why do we have a girl as a referee? And I hated it when they did have a girl as a referee. Um, and I heard a lot of rumors. And then one night, sitting out in the Marriott parking lot in Albany, New York, she kind of like, told me her whole life story, which I'm not going to say now, but, you know, she kind of like really uh, blew my mind at some of the things she said. And I just, I just uh, kind of pass it on as Hogwarts or just some stupid broad around her mouth. But then I heard a lot of allegations later on and saw her on television and I go, gee, she told me that same thing three years ago, you know. So are you guys close? No, no, no. No, no, I don't know if she was coming on to me or, or whatever. She just brought me out and we had like a, a little smoke break. And uh, that was about the closest I ever got. Sometimes a little smoke break is all you need to get close to uh, a lady. Uh, but there were allegations later on, specifically yeah. directed towards uh, uh, Vince McMahon. How was she treated by the other, I mean, you're an old school guy and we know your dad and the history and all that, so we could pretty much figure out how you would have felt about uh, the charade of, of, uh, of what they were doing. But how did the other boys feel about uh, her working their matches? I really don't know. I really don't know that. I just know I didn't like it. Was she subject to the ribs that the other guys are in the locker room or? No, she was all to herself. But I don't think anybody likes to have it girl referee. I mean, I can't accept two other girls, you know. I can't imagine that. She should have, I don't know what was the purpose of that, or it was uh, uh, someone trying to get something on Vince for not hiring females, or I, mean, I don't know what. Mm -hmm. I don't know what her reason was for even being there in the first place. Switching things up, you know, I, I think that was the main reason to, to switch things up, and they they, they wanted. Uh, I think they were going in the direction. They knew what they were going to do before they do it. I'll say one thing about McMahon and Patterson and everybody that sat up there in that office in Titan Towers all those years. 
those guys, they work constantly, morning till night, planning out what they were doing. And I mean, they knew what they were doing six months to a year down where WCW didn't know what they were doing that day when they went to do TV. Um, that's the truth. Albano now we're going to see take a babyface role as a manager. Uh, what's your thought on that decision? I thought it was good because of Cindy Lauper. Um, he was my my manager when I won the won the belt, and um, I was I did always lay I was laying there in, in the dressing room and where we used to do Poughkeepsie television. Moved from Allentown to Poughkeepsie, New York. I was laying in the dressing room. Passed out, half asleep, no, no sleep at all, you know, being on the road all the time. And they introduced me to Jimmy Hart. I thought it was Gary Hart. Like, wait a minute, that's Jimmy. I don't know who Jimmy Hart. Who's Jimmy Hart? This is your new manager. What happened to Captain Lewis? So I was, you know, I was kind of like, that caught me by surprise. But I knew with the Cindy Lopler gig and everything that he would have to be a, a baby face. So. What, you know, we lost Lou, of course, in the past, yes. last six months or so. Uh, what's your what's your best Lou story uh, as a tribute to him? Uh, if we could share a laugh, of everyone's got a laugh. Well, you know, we used to do. Um, I'm going from seventy, the period between seventy nine and eighty four, when we always did the Allentown uh, and Hamburg TVs. Um, the night after the Allentown TV, the first TV. There, we always met at a restaurant way out in the middle of the country. Uh, I only knew about it because Grand Wizard would take me there, and it was just not all the guys were there. Uh, there'd be Vincent Mann, Vincent Mann Sr., there'd be uh, Gorilla Monsoon, Arnold Scullin, all the office guys, Freddie Blassie, the managers. I think the only other wrestler besides myself was Sergeant Slaughter was in there. And every once in a while, give and take, a, a different wrestler would show up. But I made these dinners every three weeks. And Captain Lou, by the end of the dinner, would be so drunk and so hammered, and he'd be r rolling out those jokes and firing them out left and right. And he had everybody rolling. But I mean, these jokes were below the belt, so to speak. Like, he would say things like, well, wait. We're going to be really in trouble if anything happens to the old man here and this kid takes over. We're all going to be in trouble. We're all going to lose our jobs. Well, uh, sure enough. <laughs> <laughs> and and it wasn't, he wasn't just after Vince Jr., but he, he attacked everybody except me because I'm a new kid on the block. But he, he attacked everybody. And, and it, was, it was finally Vince uh, Sr. would get to where he got, he would get mad at him. All right, you know, and then finally we'd break up. And, but it happened every three weeks like clockwork. Captain Lou was one of the, when he quit drinking, he wasn't funny anymore. And, and, and when he lost all that weight, and I guess because he had the bad ticker, but man, he was just hilarious. This is the funniest stuff. Too bad we didn't have a camera going on that stuff because it was classical. The, the stories we always hear, were they true? A, a fistful of vodka at the garden uh, every four weeks? Or, yeah. Backstage. Yeah. I'm talking this yeah. era, 83. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Vince Jr. got tired of that act real quick after Vince Sr. was out of the picture, oh, yeah. right? Well, Sr. got tired of it, but he still he loved these guys, and he just excused it. He'd get mad a little bit. Yeah. But... When, uh, when Junior took over, he's really not Junior, he's... True, that yeah. is true. Uh, but he is his son, and he... Vincent uh, K, we'll call him, Vincent yeah, Kennedy. He, uh, he was kind of tired of that crap. Your thoughts on Hillbilly Jim? He's one lucky guy. Um, not much talent, uh, nice guy, uh, he's had a job with WWE, F, whatever, for years, doing what, I don't know. Um, he hurt his leg in San Diego, I guess he hurt it really, really bad, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a, with a match with Brutus Beefcake, Johnny Valiant was the 
manager. I'm, I'm not knocking him or anything like that. I just very limited talent, and uh, but I mean, people did like him and everything. But uh, you know, he got hurt and they took care of him. And gee, there's been so many other guys that had a hundred times more talent and got hurt and they just pushed him on the wayside. So I don't understand. I don't know. Maybe he knew where the body was buried. How, how did he even come to be uh, at this time? Where did he emerge from? Had you known him prior to this? Mudlick, Tennessee. Mudlick, Kentucky, right? That was the gimmick town. Uh, no, I, uh, they brought him in with Uncle Elmer, and then they had another hillbilly running around. And, what oh, the hell is with the hillbillies and, there? And, the, and they, would, they would put me and Brutus against those guys, and I oh, God, not this again. The only time I really enjoyed it was when they told me that they wanted me to beat Uncle Elmer right in the middle of the ring in Madison Square Garden. I go, all right. Well, I can't figure four that big slob, but I've been dropping an elbow on him. And, uh, and that was kind of the end of Uncle Elmer. Uncle Elmer's kind of a sweet guy. He, he sold fake Rolexes all the time. I remember watching one of the British Bulldogs look at his Rolex, and all of a sudden, the face and, and the spring and everything flies out like this. He, GD and he throws this. What the hell? He says, well, you can't buy a Rolex for $25. What the hell is wrong with you, you know? I thought it was perfect because I, because again, Barry was another one that followed me from Mid-South. We were there together. I'd work with him there. And he was a big... 300 pounder that could just bounce around like I mean you gave him a hip toss and he flew over your head like you, you know you had catapulted him and you did pff, that's all you did he was gone right so he was a natural to have a big man that can bump particularly because Ivan was a little older even mm -hmm. at that time and it you know wasn't going to be a high fly bumper even though he still a workhorse and of course Nikita was you know the, the the Frankenstein monster they'd built him to be, so that wasn't even in his genetic makeup. So to me, he was the perfect fit to, to make that you know m much more diversified and a lot more combinations of how you can mix the three of them up yeah. and have a good match with all kind of different people. How are the decisions made on what manager goes to what wrestler? Are you given any input or are you just assigned somebody? Yeah, they, they pretty much, well, you can bitch about it. You know, they say, well, we want you to be with uh, so-and-so. And I said, well, that's not going to work. I mean, you can, but you're pretty much, they, they really want, they want full control pretty much. You can, you know, it depends on how much stroke you have if you're drawing money if you if you know you can kind of like uh kind of uh, the word i'm trying to is fate you know make your own fate if you have the leverage to do yeah. something like i don't that. know why they would put fuji with Nightheart, but i think later on uh you know they had bret hart in there and they you know hey we'll put them together so now, food, the decision to make Fuji a manager happens around this time. Put, they put him in the bowler hat with the, with the cane. And, the, mm -hmm. and was this anything you would have ever thought happened, knowing Fuji for all these years? His thing was he, he Would he have been your choice for Managers were traditionally back then mouthpieces. Right. I thought he was good at that, you know, because he, he was really getting too old to work anymore. Um, I thought he was good at it. Attendance in the arena is, in fact, great the first time, but as time goes on, things do pick up. Uh, what do you make of the company decision at that time um, of expanding yeah. north? Do you think there's risk? I didn't know, really know what to think about it, because when I came, they were already, you know, talking about going to the Java Mosque and different places that I'd never heard of, these little you know, places up north. And I remember the tour and going up there, because I remember walking the streets of New York City just, you know, kind of sightseeing and stuff while we were up there. And it was very just weird to me. It was cold. It was foreign. They obviously didn't really know who we were. 
you know, this, our syndicated TV wasn't as strong there, you know, maybe as they would like to have thought that it mm -hmm. was. And I knew it, they liked, once we got them in the building, they liked the product. I mean, they liked seeing Steamboat and Flair go out there and, and, and have that kind of classic wrestling match mm -hmm. and that kind of competition. But they didn't know the characters or the storylines or anything. And we had to kind of paint that picture as we went and, re and educate them, right. you know, every time they walked in the building. You do work other cities in the Northeast, but Philly in particular becomes a very popular, you become very popular in Philadelphia in particular. Do you know why the, the identity works so well? I, you know, I, I don't know because I had been, you know, I'd done really well in Mid-South and of course that's New Orleans and, and the Cajuns and, and, and well in Houston, which was a very diversified culture of people. And I don't know whether it was the fact that they liked a, a tough underdog fighting back mm -hmm. from the bottom up. It was something they could relate to trying to overcome in their life because, I mean, I, you know, when I was perf performing and at my best, I was 6'2", six, uh, six two, 240, and in good shape, but I wasn't like all puffed up like Superman, but I wasn't a little guy like the Rock and Roll Express either. Uh, I was somebody that I could wrestle and have a believable match with a 275 pounder or a 300 pounder, but I could also work with somebody that was 210 pounds and it'd be diversified like that because Tully was always smaller than me, yet we had these very tenacious matches. And I think the fans always are living vicariously through you. So if you can paint the picture that you're double tough, but somebody's got to cheat to take advantage of you, but you're going to keep fighting and fighting and fighting to come back and eventually overcome, that that becomes something they can relate to, particularly if they come from a hard working class of people and have challenges in their life. All of a sudden they see something they can identify with who's down there with the lights focused on them and they're cheer it's like cheering for themselves almost. Right. It gives them a hope. Identify a hope yeah. that, you know, things really can be better. Cause I, so I'm escaping my reality and I'm seeing my reality, you know, just you know, juice to the jet max and getting ready to see, you know, what it could be. If I could be a superhero for a day, this is what I'd be. And I think it's something they could relate to. Did you work Japan at this time in your tenure with WWE? Yeah, I, I started going to Japan in 1975 and I probably went twice a year uh, for Anoki and when I got to New York he had a relationship with New York so I just kept going and uh, and I, I don't remember if I was over there on that particular one but I was over there on a lot of them. But when they go, when you're sent with some kind of agreement between the New York office and the Japan office, um, who's handling your, your bookings, your travel, that's all done by the Japanese That's office. all done by the Japanese but they um, as far as who's going to win this and that, you know, it's kind of like, depends on how important you are, but they usually, um, usually we went over there and we did TV the first couple of days we were there and we beat the hell out of Japanese and then, uh, then we'd go all, all over the country and they'd beat the hell out of us to get back to us, but they'd put us over strong on the television. Your paydays were negotiated beforehand before you went over or were you paid yeah, on, yeah. based on the house? No, they were they were contract, and you'd sign a contract, and then you would get paid in cash when you left that the day before you left. And it was good money. Which it was, was worth it to go. Oh there. yeah, and it was always a nice stack of hundred dollar bills, and and you know I hated Japan until later on when I got older. I enjoyed it, but those first few years in the late seventies and eighties before it became westernized and stuff. It was brutal over there. You know. What was tough, the, the, the travel? Oh, the, yeah, well, it was before they had roll-away bags, you know, the wheels on them, you had to carry your bags, and you went all, they had no uh, 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 escalators in the, in the train stations. You had to walk, 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 and then walk down, down, and walk, walk, get on a train, ride this train, and, and they weren't always the bullet trains, which were real nice. It was a, rickety ones and sometimes we rode buses and I don't know how I survived that. I mean we'd be up in the mountains and and you'd be on a uh, highway that's no wider in this room and this great big huge bus and he would just be whipping through like a man. So you know it's it was 
it was some crazy. Sometimes we'd stay on a ferry for a couple of days, go somewhere like Sapporo, northern Japan, and be on a ferry overnight, and then all the rest of the day and get off and just start. I mean, it was you had to be really, really in, in good shape to even endure it. And plus, you get in the ring with those Japanese guys, and if you backed off, if you were, oh, that hurts a little bit, then they were like, ah, you know. They'd really go after you, but if you showed them you were tough, then they backed off, just like they did in the war. Same thing. And what I was going to say, did you go stiff initially just to show them that this is how? You know, yeah, not well, so they, much they, they, they saw me in Los Angeles before I ever got to WWF, and Anoki went through, and I was at the Olympic, and he saw I hit the guys over the chest and all that kind of stuff, and right away that was my ticket to Japan because he likes that stiff work. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Tell us about it. Well, first tell us about Mr. T. What's the general attitude as he's coming in to uh, do the big wrestling? Well, everybody hated Mr. T because he's prima donna. Um, and he didn't, you know, he, he didn't jive with the other wrestlers. And, and you could tell by watching the match, that horrible boxing match they had with Piper in WrestleMania too. And he just had a real bad attitude. Um, cause nobody liked him. And it's not the racial thing or anything like that because you know, we had people like Junkyard Dog and people like that who were sweethearts, so... Um, was he disrespectful to the wrestlers? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, tell us about David Schultz now. Talk about putting two scorpions in a bottle. You've got Mr. T who no one likes and you've got... Was, David, that, eight, was David that 85? Yeah. Okay, well, he was... He had had his run with Hogan, and I guess he didn't understand the nature of the business. You have, you have your run with Hogan, and then you're going to have a run with someone else, or you ran out of the territory, and then you come back later. Uh, he didn't understand it that way, and he wanted, he wanted, uh, he thought he was being screwed, so he was going to make his own angle. So he was, I guess Mr. T was in the ring or somebody, I'm not really familiar who was in the ring, but he was going to go out down and make his own angle and get in the ring and nail somebody, which was without the office knowing about it. And so I, I kind of caught some of the wind of this, but I wasn't really sure what was going on. And Strombo was the agent. He was standing there, you know, his big belly, and he goes, hey, Greg, what's this? There goes Schultz. Now he's going down to make his move to get in the ring. All of a sudden, Los Angeles police, about 15 of them, grabbed him, brought him back, handcuffed him, shackled him, now he's laying there like this, and he's crying, and he's got, I mean, he looked like he was in agony, though. He just laid there on the floor for about an hour with his face in the ground. Now, this wasn't long after he smashed Stossel, yeah. the guy from uh, Fox, well, he works for Fox now. That was, I think, in December 84, so this is just a couple of months yeah, after that. Yeah. yeah, and so they were pretty much uh, fed up with him. Did he ever get to tea? In the ring, did no, he? No, he never got that far. They got him, they got him, <laughs> he was just on almost to the apron and then the police got him and drug him back. You think Mr. T would have been able to handle himself with his uh, boxing background if, if ever he came to it? I heard he was a spar, he used to spar with some good guys, so, you know, anybody who knows anything about boxing, that's a pretty rough sport. You know, we had a big feud in the Carolinas, and, and we were good friends. I had a lot of respect for Piper. But when he came in, uh, I came in before he did, but when he came in around 84, uh, they were really wanting, they liked the Piper's pit, they liked that thing, but they were really molding, they wanted Piper to be a manager. They didn't want him to wrestle, they thought he was too small. And he switched that out, you know, he switched that around. And he became, no manager, he became their top heel. How smartened up was Mr. T at this point? I'm not sure. I, I'm, he was half smart, I'll say half. Putting him with Piper now, is the, uh, Piper also readily admits that there was no love lost between 
he and Mr. T. Yeah. Was there any fear that Piper would go maybe too far um, in antagonizing them? Well, Piper, you know, he won the Golden Gloves when he was a kid in Canada, so he knew how to box. Uh, that match was kind of horrific, but it wasn't. I, I've seen worse matches than that. Um, you just, Mr. T, you just did what you could with him. And he did, he did, he did uh, draw a spark. Uh, his A-team thing was over at the time, and uh, mm. he did draw a spark there. Very nice guy to me. Um, I know I've heard other people say different things, and I'm not going to name drop or anything. But you know, you only I only uh, talk about people and and how they treat me. You know, how they treat Greg Valentine, not how they treat this other guy. And that's really what you got to do in this business because there's so many different personalities. And I always thought Bruno was fine. The only I wrestled him three different times, and most of the time I was laying on my stomach with my head on the canvas with my left arm, which, you know, I got pretty big arms and he had it twisted like this. And, and pretty much the whole match I was like that. And then he let me take over and I got some heat and we went home. But um, other than that, he's always been a pretty good guy with me. Bruno really didn't want to have this comeback in the mid 80s. Um, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. And I, I, from what I understand, he made that very known to anyone who would ask him about it. Is this true? Yeah, I and mean, he, he was kind of tired. I remember he had that weave job, and and I, and it looked like a brick on top of his head. No offense, Bruno, if you were watching this, but it did look like a brick when he starts sweating, you know. And Johnny Powers had one of those, too. So I was working a TV match at Channel 11, the old famous Channel 11 in Pittsburgh. We had to drive way up this hill on top of the hill, and, and he goes, uh, I specifically, I have you for this match, and we're, we're not even going to have a finish for the match. I'm trying to advertise uh, this weave job, you know, and I'm going to show them how much punishment <laughs> that, that it can take. So I, I would be using the elbow and smashing it and smashing it, and, and, and he says, harder, harder, you know. And, and so that night, I had a match with him and a tag match in Pittsburgh. And he goes, don't hit me that hard tonight. Don't hit me that hard tonight. You know, so. It was just for the advertisement. <laughs> it was just for the advertisement. <laughs> was he brought back on the road uh, as an exchange for a, for a push for his son uh, from Vince? That could have been, yeah. I'm not really sure. Okay. Had he yet become very bitter and angry toward the business and toward Vince at uh, 85? Or did this all come later? I, I remember him. I remember them. Everybody, I thought everybody was a big happy family. In 1979, when I first came in here, and it was Vince, of course, the old man Vince, and it was Vince Jr. on the mic, and it was Bruno, or Pat Patters. No, Pat was in the ring. Excuse me. Bruno was doing the color, and it all seemed like a big happy family. And then all of a sudden, uh, Bruno blew up about something. I don't know. and roll and I love it uh, today and love it love all that old stuff and uh, to have that rock and roll wrestling connection I thought it was fantastic I thought it was great you know I felt like I was one of the Beatles or something you know yeah. and, uh, and it really it really did that marriage with the rock and roll plus uh, then it was a marriage with uh, with Hollywood too along that same line so it really brought us out of the out of the six pack, uh, six pack of beer type fan, you know. Right, and actually uh, on this card and around this time, you start to see celebrities in the audience now right. in New York City. Uh, Andy, Andy Warhol, Warhol. Warhol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Danny DeVito. Like, oh, there he is, right there, Andy Warhol. Yeah. Did they come of their own volition, or were they invited by the office? No, they they had been. Uh, Andy Warhol 
was coming for years. Like I, when I first went there in 79, I saw him, you know, and uh, I think Captain Lou pointed him out, he said, sit there, and you know, he had those weird glasses. <laughs> and there was a lot of different people that I, I don't, uh, can't remember. Oh, I remember seeing uh, Gene Hackman ringside and uh, just to name a few, and uh, it's hard to remember. Yeah, sure. Um, that night, there's a big schmaz in the ring with, with Piper and everything, and a, a bunch of New York City police officers, it looks like, uh, get into the ring to break it up. Are these real cops? Is this, are they told what to do? How is that arranged when you're using real police officers to break up a work? They, they, they tell them that, that it's going to happen. I think so. I'm not sure. I'm not in that, or I, I don't really have a, remember having a match where I had police involved. But police don't really know how to work. But I think they, uh, they pick a few guys and they'll, and they'll say, well, listen, we just kind of want to break this up, but don't hit anybody with your billy club and that sort of thing. So they kind of, you got a few that are half smart. Was there a real injury associated with that initially? I think he broke his wrist. He did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you party with Bob? Yeah, Bob and I, in fact, I had a few beers with him last week in North Carolina. Bob is a good friend of mine, and he, he was a, a great wrestler. What would that hotel floor look like? A little Greg Valentine, a little Don Morocco, a little Bob Orton, a little Adrian Adonis? Is that the floor I'd get any sleep on? No. Probably not. No. Especially at the old Hojo's over here in Newark. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was pretty hairy. You could add Hercules to that list on the Hojo's also. So I hear. Dan Spivey is tagging with him. What are Hall and Spivey like at this time? Just two big guys that you look at, they look like a million bucks, and they were both just, you know, not comfortable in their own skin, you know, just really had, like two giant puppies, <laughs> kind of, you know, that's the only way I know how to explain it. Both huge potential people, and, and Dusty was huge fans of them. He's the one that kept coming up with ideas of what he could do with these guys, and, uh, you know, and he believed in them and wanted to give them something. And that, and that was the reason that Scott, went to the mid we kind of worked in hand in hand with that group at the time we would we'd use that almost not like a developmental territory like today but if we wanted to move somebody out where they didn't get so scrutinized where they weren't exactly where we wanted them to be we'd send them out to kansas city in that area and let them work by right. mcgoggle's group and those different folks around there kind of get some more polish and stuff and then we trade talent back and forth like that so that wasn't an unusual move to have been made at that time and it's the very reason i didn't break in in my home home of uh, right. you know, Atlantic Market. I mean, I wanted to be a polished professional when I came came in here, and and, it, and I was able to do that in a really pretty amazing amount of time because most people don't learn the ropes in three years, right. particularly to, to get to a main event level. So I was very fortunate that I was on a fast track, but uh, I think that was always the thought. If you saw some promise in somebody that wasn't ready, they you know we'll we'll kind of put them over here to get them out of the uh, out from under the microscope until it's time to bring them back. Was there a real injury associated with that initially? I think he broke his wrist. He did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you party with Bob? Yeah, Bob and I, in fact, I had a few beers with him last week in North Carolina. Bob is a good friend of mine, and he, he was a, a great wrestler. What would that hotel floor look like? A little Greg Valentine, a little Don Morocco, a little Bob Orton, a little Adrian Adonis? <clears throat> is that the floor I'd get any sleep on? No. Probably not. No, especially at the old Hojo's over here in Newark. <laughs> Uh, it was it was pretty hairy. You could add Hercules wow. to that list on the Hojo's also. So I hear. Yeah. 
more importantly than the slap though I think to the guys in the business is that now there is an official I think the first official expose expose about blading about the business being a work uh, what were your thoughts upon seeing it uh, the first time did you see it when it aired the first time probably on the road no, I, I, I heard about it and of course I hated it because I wanted everybody to believe and especially my match I wanted to and, and that was the whole that's how I drew money and, and drew and stayed on top is because I was believable and to have to have all this stuff come out about a blade and all this other I hated it Eddie Mansfield is the wrestler that exposed that, and he's also working with Jim Wilson in the uh, 2020 piece. What were their motivations for doing this, the business that they were trying to make a living in? I, you know, I, I met Eddie, I mean, I wanted to kill him when I, when I first saw that he did it, and then I met him about 20 years later or something, and I worked for him, he ran a show in Aruba. You know, it was like it had already been exposed by hundreds of people. Um, so by by that time, so you know, I don't know what what his motivation was for him doing it the first time. He really got a lot of heat with a lot of guys. Well, I don't think he, he was probably never hired again after that, right? Yeah, but he you know he he ended up merging. He emerged in Orlando and had some kind of a little wrestling league on television down there at the Universal lot. Um, I don't know, fifteen <laughs> years later or something. You'd think that he would be scared to get back in the business, but he never got, no one ever did anything to him. Did um, did McMahon share his feelings with you guys about this piece? And uh, the, your, your your federation was, was the one that was heavily focused in this piece. I don't remember talking to Vince about it. Um, nobody liked it, though. I know they didn't like it. Um, Specifically, the blading. I think that that's the first time that that had ever been exposed. I think that was the weather. That was kind of hard for people to believe that yeah. that we would cut ourselves with razor blades. They, they'd rather believe that you had a bottle of ketchup and break it on your head, or or uh, I don't know how many people have asked me, well, blood capsule. And, yeah, I got a blood capsule. Yeah, I'm gonna bite it here and I'm gonna hit it on my head here. You know, I mean that 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 they would rather hear or understand, but they. A razor blade, you know, that was hard for them to digest. Um, did you? Were you one of the people that didn't like blading? No, I don't know who likes it, but no, I, mean, I liked it. You I liked, liked it. it. It was like having a climax for me. It really was. Blading yourself. Okay. Well, it was so, like this. I would build my match. I always had long, long matches, and uh, it started in the Carolinas. And uh, in fact, my first match I ever had in WWF, I went an hour long with Backlund, which was like being in a dentist chair and have all your teeth pulled out with no Novocaine. <laughs> so, but I would enjoy building the match up. I wouldn't like to see two guys like Flair and Hogan did the other night and just go out and cut and for no reason, just, just to do it. I would do it towards where the baby face was trying to beat me, beat me for the belt, and then I would open myself up and then it would look like I'm really getting beat. You know, I would use it as a story, and then I would slide out with the one, two, three covered in blood, and, and that was painting my picture, it was telling my story. It wasn't just going out there like Abdul the Butcher and Mark Lewin and cutting yourself the first two minutes of the match or like Flair and Hogan did the other night, just so you don't have to take any bumps. Uh, back to the Dr. D incident for a minute. Was Dave Schultz looked at as a, some kind of locker room hero for standing up to the reporters that were coming in to try and expose the business? <laughs> uh, at first, I think, at first when he whacked him, and I was there, but I, I must have been in the ring when it happened or something, but I heard about it. And, and he said that Vince told him to go do it, or he didn't tell him to go out and actually hit him. He just go out and give him a piece of your mind. He went out there and whacked him and whacked him again. And for a while, nothing was said about it. He was kind of, I think he was kind of like a, a hero until the thing in L.A. happened when he tried to work his own angle. So you have no knowledge of, of him ever being told to put his hands on Stossel? Uh, 
Well, he says... Other than what he said. He said that Vince told him, but I heard from several good sources that Stossel was out there interviewing people, and all I heard that Vince said was, go out there and take care of him, but he didn't tell him to go out and hit him. Right. I mean, take care of him could be anything, you know? Hart's brought in now. He's the sixth manager on the roster here. Why so many managers at this point? Gee, I, I was kind of wondering that myself. But uh, I, I think the other guys were getting older and they were fading away. And Graham Wizard had passed away. Um, and Jimmy Hart, they just liked. They heard about it, you know. They heard about him. They liked his. Uh, what he could do with the music and sort of thing like that. I think it was kind of that rock and roll connection that got Jimmy Hart in there. But there was a, a quite a few managers there. Uh, the megaphone gimmick. Who comes up with this? So that must have Jimmy. been Jimmy. Yeah, okay. that must have been Jimmy. Now they put they put you with him right off the bat. Right. And what did you think in your first few times with him? Do you think there was a chemistry there? Yes. Well, he was a very nice guy. I liked him. Uh, he, we were with each other constantly. In fact, I kind of got jealous when they started bringing Bundy into the deal. For, so for about six, seven months, it was just me and Jimmy, and, and I liked it that way. And Jimmy was hell of a nice guy, and, and he was a rock and roller, and we'd, we'd, um, we got along really, really well, except he always got me up too early in the morning. But um, I really enjoyed Jimmy Hart with me. I sure did. We're still good friends too. He also used to do that Valentine thing yeah. and mispronounce your name purposely. Yeah. Was that a little rib to you or just yeah. just something he Yeah, just something he did. Or maybe it was that Tennessee accent. Any thoughts on Joe Murto while we're on it? <laughs> Big Joe Murto? I can't remember him. He was one of the enhancement talents. There's a lot of guys I've wrestled and I've never you know, you, they'd walk up to me and I'd say, I've never met you. You don't remember? Uh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. Your TV taping is being done at the Mid uh, Hudson Coliseum now, uh, Mid Hudson Civic Center Pukip rather, in Poughkeepsie, Pukipsi, yeah. uh, a place not known for its locker room accommodations for 12-hour days with. Oh yeah, they were in the promos. basement. Yeah. <laughs> they were in a basement. They can actually didn't you, have locker rooms. Can I tell you a funny story? Yeah, please. Because this is the time. This is the time frame. Jake the Snake was down there with. Uh, his snake, and then the bulldogs were down there, and, and and we were doing interviews in this horrible locker room, but it was in a hallway, and they just stuck a WWF board in the back, and Gene Oakland, of course, was there doing the interviews, and everywhere we were going, we were just trying to squeeze these interviews, because you had to do, you had personalized interviews for every city around back then, it wasn't all generalized. So, here's the snake in the bag, and I think it was Davy Boy Smith, who's no longer with us. He was lighting the tail of the uh, python with his lighter, and this python has got to be getting pissed, you know. And I'm watching it, and I, you know, I don't want nothing to do with this. So I get away from it. All of a sudden, I hear this commotion. Jake comes in, gets the snake, and you know, he used to wrap it around his head and do his interviews, right? So he starts talking, and me and Gene gives him the microphone, you know, gives it, points it to his lips, and all of a sudden the snake goes like, like this, and Jake's going, ooh, ooh, and he's yelling for help, he's yelling for help, and I think Junkyard Dog was there, he looked, you know how black people are about snakes, he ran the other way, and there were about three different agents came, and they, here's Jake being choked out, and they're pulling the snake off of him, and uh, that was, that's the end of the story. Neither said Jake survived it, but boy, there was a lot of ribbing. Well, I was in the China Club that night, and we had a show. I don't know where we had a show at, but uh, I remember Flair and everybody coming into the China Club, and we were all having drinks and stuff, and uh, I remember that era, and I remember they, they went out, they couldn't get into the garden, but I, w I remember they went to Nassau, Long Island, 
But that was really the beginning of the end for Jim Crockett because he was trying to go to Chicago. And if he would have just stayed down south instead of flying big old fat dusty rolls all over the place, and it was Dusty that ran that thing right into the ground. And no offense to Dusty, because I like him, but I give Jimmy Hart let him, I mean Jimmy Hart, Jimmy Crockett let him do that, so I guess it wasn't Dusty's fault, but um, they went broke out, they bellied up, because they, they couldn't keep that, couldn't draw the crowds and ex handle the expenses, and plus they're flying on private jets and stuff. Well, now, are there any attempts at sabotage with the f two federations competing for buildings? The one story, uh, is there any truth to the story that Vince tipped off the uh, State Athletic Commission about Jerry Black, the condition of Jerry Blackwell before he had a main event match in the Meadowlands? Um, and he was summarily examined and told that he couldn't wrestle that night. You ever hear that? No, I, I never did hear that, but I imagine things like that have been done. I might have dreamt it. I know. I know a lot of uh, a lot of shows I've been on that they've been. I'm not going to say sabotaging, but because I've been independent for a long time, you have some big names and you have a big crowd, and and you always hear rumors that someone tried to sabotage it and blah blah blah. And I, I think some of it might might be true. Jack had kind of retired. He was had the body shop down there in Tampa, and, and uh, I remember Jerry and Jack uh, against Young Blood and Steamboat, and the Briscoes were the heels on Mid Atlantic, and it, it was fantastic. And they, both those guys are great. We're, all four of them were great workers. They had great matches. Jerry Briscoe was great on the microphone as a heel, and then I didn't I didn't remember seeing those guys again. All of a sudden, they showed up. In WWF, and I didn't know the politics behind it, but um, Jack Briscoe just passed away, by the way, and he was a very good friend of mine. Honestly, it didn't really raise an eyebrow simply because of the fact I grew up watching John Wayne, right? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Cowboys, Indians, the good guys, the bad guys, and I've seen. You know, John Wayne, you know, dust a woman, you know, across across the face if she was hitting him over there with a baseball bat or an iron or something, and and so it didn't. I didn't. I didn't read a whole lot into that. Is in terms of uh, uh, the things that would happen today, of course, in 2015. But uh, and and then again, I didn't. You know, I didn't look at Baby Doll like this little feminine demure creature that needed protecting. I mean, pretty much. <laughs> Everybody, with the exception of a few of us, were questioning whether we could take her if she really went, you know, went goofy. So, you know, it, it, I knew it would get a reaction, and uh, and obviously, you know, it did. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't go all crazy about the political type right. thought process of it. There time. was no uh, negative backlash from television or anything like that. Zero. Oh. Yeah. Different time, as yeah. we said. Yeah. Talk about working in, um, literally, in the opposition's backyard. I was on that first show that we did at the TBS. Mm -hmm. I remember going out, and, and I I kind of gloated about it because Atlanta, you know, Charlotte and, and all that area always got a big push, but every time I went down to Atlanta, they treat me like shit. So now I'm here under the WWF banner, and I just kind of gloated around. And, my belt and everything, and I said, oh, hell with you guys down here in TBS, you know, WCW bullshit. Never really had a good run with those guys because it was ran by wrestlers, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that takeover. 
they um, you didn't shoot down there too long before it went back uh, right. away from Vince. But the decision to use the TBS studios as opposed to you working bigger houses for your TV tapings on Mid Hutchins. I mean, they're not full arenas, but they're bigger. I mean, you couldn't get more than what maybe I don't know 50, 75 people in those uh, in the TV studio, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was small. I think it was just really a power play thing. Oh. You know what I mean? Gotcha. That definitely felt like that. Was Gorilla miserable not being able to get good spaghetti in, uh, in Atlanta, you know? <laughs> Probably. Um, Freddie Miller, a bit yeah, of an enigma. A, from Boston, was he? Freddie Miller? No, he used to do the, 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 he used to do the stand-up uh, portion for the TV, uh, the TBS uh, tapings. Oh, okay. That's kind of a, 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 a portly... Uh, Portly. How else, Port Lee, how else would you describe Freddie Miller? Kind of a goofy character. Where is he? Do you, do you remember? I'm, I'm, where he? When you mentioned Freddie Miller, I was thinking of somebody from Boston. Okay, so, so there's the answer. <laughs> I knew Marty, Arn Anderson, Marty Lundy, from again from from Mid South. And he had come in there, and, and you know, come in there and done favors on the TV for people, and and I and I'd watched him move and watched him work and watched him bump. What I didn't know back then, because obviously he was just coming in to do a TV match, and I'd worked with him on that TV. I didn't know he could talk, and so when I saw him interview, I knew instantly he was money, because yeah, he had all the mechanical things he could do in the ring, but when you combine that with the fact that you could talk. And then you've got that look that's similar to the cookie cutter, you know, Minnesota Wrecking Crew type look. Then it was money in the bank. How did he get along with Oli? First of all, did anyone get along with Oli? And then how did Arn get along with Oli? Again, the, we kayfabed so much. We didn't travel together. We didn't do, you know, the only time we saw each other in the same room was very limited occasions, stuff where you'd be at the office and stuff. But, uh, you know, we all had such a different respect at that time, people didn't vocalize the kind of things that they would today. Mm -hmm. If Arn had some, some uh, you know, brashness thoughts or something about Ole, he wasn't going to say so. And Ole was really a different guy, I believe, at this time than he was back in the days of running Georgia Championship Wrestling and all that. Ole, the talent and the guy in the dressing room, he was funny. He was funny to be around. He was a comical guy. And he's just, just gosh, man. Just a tough old rock solid, and you know, they called him Rock. I mean, he, he I mean, I, I'll never forget we're in, we're on TV and we're in a some kind of four man or some some kind of crazy stuff. You know, Flair would always run in, wanted you to do the press slam over your head with him. And, you know, Flair weighed you know 230 pounds soaking wet. Maybe it was you know he would always about fly your hand. All of a sudden I look and and Ole's running at me. He said press slam. I'm going, oh dear God. You know, only he's 275 pounds, and I'm, I'm pretty stout, but I don't know about this. And, and next thing I knew, man, he shot up. He was boom and bam. And then I said, you know, he can go if he wants to go. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I, I loved the little bit of time I got to spend in that piece with him. Uh, but, he, yeah, he was special. He was a real addition to what was going on. What do you think of of the game, the Nature Boy gimmick he comes up with? And I mean, it's a carbon copy of Flair, obviously. And and does Rick have any issues with that? I don't think Rick had issues. And, and uh, again, I was with Buddy in Mid South. I knew Buddy, different personality, uh, interesting guy. But I always knew that Buddy was going to be Buddy's worst, own worst enemy. That his lack of tact at the right time. He didn't know how to be politically correct. It wasn't in his DNA. And and uh, I could have a lot of fun with Buddy. I had some great matches with him. I got to work some, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I worked with him in Philly or, or Baltimore or somewhere, and we went like 30 some minutes. And you know, he, he had the opportunity to get a huge push. And uh, I don't think Rick ever really looked at him as, as any major type threat, because I think Rick always knew somewhere in the back of his head that because of the political nature of the business, that that would, that would work itself out in time. In order for him to have had long-term success there, Buddy Landell, 
it, something would have had to change. You couldn't have Rick and him be on top, basically being the same guy. Someone would have had to morph into something else. Right? Exactly, and and Buddy just morphed himself out, so it really right. did, it didn't really matter. Oh yeah, I remember that, and they choked him down. Yeah, he front face locked him. his head open. And uh, put so you him out. That. Okay, it was a front face lock. It wasn't a sleeper. Boom! Yeah. He lifted like that, and yeah. the guy let him go, and the guy fell down like a chicken, plopped up back and forth, and split his head open, and they went black. And then they came back. I remember I watched it live, huh. and uh, I think Belzer got a million dollars. Yeah, or something he. Like he that. Uh, I think it's. Uh, Settles out of court for an undisclosed amount, was suing for five. But I mean, the office reaction, they must have been going nuts. Now here, here we are a couple of days away from the biggest investment that mm -hmm. Vince has made in a long time. And now we got this action here, rough, uh, a rough road. Well, that that's just shows you that you can't grab these people like that. And you know, Hogan got 25 inch arms and doing that to that guy. That was a dumb move on his part. I think he's admitted that himself uh, yeah. since it's happened. This was intentional for it to be a one night shot? Never knew the Y four, but it was a six man and I was in it, right? Right. Uh yeah. It's yes. uh it's you you're with them you're and right. then it's Ivan Nikita and uh right. Crusher. And this was before, you know, any of course way before the feud with Nikita and I or any of that stuff. And and I you know, I just looked at it like, you know, a visiting, you know, superstar coming into the territory. Uh, I didn't I didn't really think about any any kind of political dynamic or anything. And it was a lot of fun. It was it was it was a fun match to work. The reason that they needed him in the first place was it was supposed to be Steamboat uh, with you, but he uh, he, he leaves. He left. For, okay. For WWE. Now, uh, rumor has it the reason, the impetus for him leaving was Dusty wanted him to turn. Do you know if that's true at all? Doubt it. But tough sell, right? Yeah. For that. yeah. Steamboat heel. Yeah. Uh, I don't really see that. What did you think of the chemistry between Dusty and Tully in there? their feud, which lasted a year. Well, it was great because you got the ultimate babyface ego and the ultimate heel ego. And so you put the two of them together. And, and, and again, you got Tully who really is satisfied being Tully and being a heel. You don't have a heel that secretly wants to be a babyface. Tully didn't want to be cheered. Even though we had fans in Greensboro that, you know, loved the heels, you know, that, that wasn't, that was not his agenda. He told me from day one when I met him that his goal was to be the best heel in the business, period. End of story. He didn't say I want to be the world's champion. He didn't say anything. He said I want to be the best heel one day in the business. And I think he, he truly accomplished what he set out to do. Could he have been even a bigger singles champion? You know, perhaps you had things you know not happen the way they did. You know, quite possibly. But, you know, as far as accomplishing a goal, you know, he did that. And the chemistry with Dusty, the thing is, if you can feed Dusty and you can make Dusty look like, you know, that Superman and Muhammad Ali and uh, everything else wrapped into one that he could be during his comebacks, you had to be in crazy shape to do that. And mm. Tully could take bumps and be back up in your face faster than any human being I knew on the planet at that time. And that's what he did. He hustled so much, even while he was selling and putting over, that he'd make, he'd, you know, he'd make somebody like a million bucks. Was Tully uh, a bit of a heel behind the scenes? Tully had kind of a brash personality and kind of a, uh, a quirky cockiness about him that I, I have a hard time putting my finger on. But again, we didn't really like, we didn't like run in the same circles. We didn't have, you know, I just know because I hear little snide remarks mm -hmm. people would make at things. But my, my relationship with him had gone back to working for his dad mm -hmm. and, and seeing, you know, he's seeing might be coming from our earliest stages to walking in to, you know, the Atlantic and, and him watching me work at the program with Wahoo 
And he looks at me and said, well, you and I, you know, he knew that we could make big, big, big money together if, if uh, we got the right opportunity. So, you know, us is like two, two guys just jockeying and said, yep, you know, we, we're getting ready to make some magic. And, and, he was, and he saw in me the type of baby face that he could raise himself up even to a higher level at a singles level, but really showcase what he could do you know what you know bring help bring me up another notch up the ladder as well it, it was just that whole angle was just a win-win mm -hmm. all the way around when i was in mid-south and i don't know whether i was the north american champion at this time or not but they always had that big event at thanksgiving in uh in atlanta in the omni mm -hmm. They had a tag team tournament, and Bill always would send some talent over, and JYD and, and uh, uh, Butch Reed, myself, and somebody else. We flew over, or they flew us over on a charter plane to go work that show for Ole. And they tagged me with Randy Savage, and, and it was a tag team tournament. So we got to the finals, and it was Randy and I against Pez and... I don't know who it was. I can't remember if it was Buzz Sawyer or somebody. But anyway, I put Pez over right in the middle, and everybody flipped out that I was that I, that I had to. I said, I said I don't work here, you know. I said I'm, you know, he, Pez is a good guy. I said I'm not coming here. He they're going to be here trying to make some money. And I said I'll put him over, and, and you know, so everybody was just all happy. And I went on about my business. But years later, so when Pez comes back around, you know, of course he's in a you know, a whole different stratosphere now. And roles were really, really, really reversed. But, you know, that was viewed as like, you know, this guy's his top baby face over here in working and, and I didn't I didn't see it that way. And I'll and I'll tell you a reason why. When I was in Florida and I was a middle of the card guy, Roddy Piper worked with me in in uh, Key West. And we were out there and we were supposed to do a little match and I was supposed to put him over. We we're out there working. He said, he's a kid. He said, I'm never going to be here again. He said, I, he said, do this big bang boom. And I, and I put and He put me over the middle of the ring. And, I, and it clicked to me in my head. Doesn't matter who you are. You know, you're trying to take the best opportunity to help showcase or get, you know, the best for whoever's there. And that's their livelihood. That's what they're doing. So, you know, Pez was a good guy and I got, to, I got to do a favor for him in a, in a time and place where, People wouldn't have thought that would have happened. And then later when he'd come back around and, it, and he had a great attitude when he came into right. the Mid-Atlantic. How far in advance are you told this is going to happen? I don't remember being told in advance. I mean, I knew I was going to ultimately end up being the U.S. champion. Uh, and Wahoo and I had been, uh, you know, battling each other all over everywhere. And I can't remember even exactly why it got into the steel cage type scenario. <laughs> but it was sold out. It was a sellout and uh, uh, capacity crowd. And I do remember I got Wahoo threw me into the cage because I, I was getting ready to get some color. He threw me in the cage and it came off and my eyebrow was like, <laughs> got hooked on some, on the yeah, all, all the fence, got oh. just ripped it off. He said, ah, you don't need that. <laughs> I said, okay, good. And we Put went your on, blade away. Yeah, you're not going to need that. <laughs> but, but tell you what kind of guy Wahoo is. I, you know, I haven't seen Wahoo, haven't got to sit down on anything. The first time I do anything to do a Wahoo, Flair's rustling as a baby face in, in the Charlotte Coliseum. Wahoo, the heel, comes down to attack Ric Flair with a steel with a steel chair. Magnum, the new the new guy on the block, is told to go down there, cut Wahoo off, and drop kick him, drop kick the chair out of his hand, let him you know powder off. And I came down, adrenaline going, running Mach Seven. And when I drop kicked the chair, it came back into the Chief's head and gave him about eight stitches around here. Wow. And that's how we howdy duty to start off our deal. And he never complained, never said one, you know, that's the business, you know, pal. <laughs> it happens. So, Do you remember any sagely advice he gave you ever? I'm sure there was something. Oh, uh, you know, Chief was kind of a man of a few words. He had that big, thick chop, man, and that was kind of, <laughs> you know, walk softly, carry the big chop. He didn't have to say a whole lot. But we spent, we did spend a lot of time together 
after he dropped the title and, and he became babyface and we we rode around we traveled together As a matter of fact he would come stay at my parents house in uh, Chesapeake uh, with me sometimes like if we were there all day and hang out for the afternoon and then we'd go to you know work the show that night but uh, you know he he was just he was just a rock solid straight up guy and uh, somebody that frankly I'm honored to even ever been in the same ring with somebody of his caliber and what he represented as a professional athlete you know and later on as a professional wrestler. Let's talk about this night specifically. What, what was the significance to you to win uh, your first singles title? It, well, it was my first single title here. There, yeah. yeah, and and it was it was huge because to me, he represented. Uh, he was like Babe Ruth to me. Uh, you know, again, I, I watched him and Johnny Valentine beat each other to death for the Silver Dollar Challenge. You know, on TV as a teenager, and and you know, it, for that was my. Hulk Hogan, Andre moment, if you want to compare it to mm -hmm. something. With Andre, you're going up for the slam and putting over Hogan. For me, Wahoo, you know, doing the favor for me in the middle of sold out Charlotte, North Carolina, where he was legend and, and passing me the U.S. title. And, you know, basically saying, go for it. You know, that was, that was a, a milestone. And I've told a lot of people that. They say, because they want to talk about the flares and the Tullys and the Nikitas and all the things. And I, and I tell them, the chief, you know, if it weren't for that, the way he handed that off, uh, the momentum would not have been the same. He saw the hoopla that was going with the Rock and Roll Connection and this WrestleMania one thing, and I knew about the pay-per-views and, and stuff like that because we had done something like that in Star Starcade a couple of years before that in Crockett and Greensboro. So you knew you were on to some uh, virgin territory for wrestling, and boxing was just coming out with, with their, with their pay-per-views. So you had a feeling you were on to something really big. Uh, the atmosphere back in the locker room that night, was it, uh, was, you remember Vince's demeanor specifically? Was he nervous? Was he excited? Did you guys get like a pre-WrestleMania prep talk or? No, no. In that way, it was just like any other night, you know. I mean, we were just, we had our finishes. We knew what to do. Um, you would think, you know, I can't really remember. But it's a long time ago, but you would think they would, they would have a lot of talks with us about the importance of, you know, this deal that was happening, but um, you just kind of like uh, had to watch and see. I think Matt Bourne, who worked under a hood that night with, uh, wasn't Matt Bourne uh, the executor? Yeah, uh, oh, no, he didn't work under that. It was a Buddy Rose, right, right, right. But no, he worked with, uh, who did Matt Bourne Steve. work with? Right. He, he, I think he said that Vince kind of came around to everyone shaking hands, looking in their eyes very, very closely. Oh, going, he might have been. Going, how, how you guys doing tonight? Are you ready for tonight? Kind yeah, of checking the color so, of the eyes. Right. Seeing if you're bombed or drunk or high or... Does that ring a bell? That that might have happened? Um, well, you yeah, that could. He didn't look at me. But I was going to say, maybe you wouldn't, one of the, wouldn't be I one of the guys. I was a pro, though. <laughs> um, the the uh, post-show party. At uh, uh, Rockefeller Center? Do you remember uh, a big I, post I wasn't show invited. There? You weren't invited? Wow. Speaking of not being I invited. I just grabbed my belt and went to the Ramada Inn. Eighth and 40, <laughs> eighth and 51st yeah. over there. Um, speaking of not being invited, you had longtime WWF stars, WWE stars like uh, Putski, Morocco, Ken Patera, not with no place on the card at, at WrestleMania, um, were there hard feelings with any of these guys? Well, Morocco was in the territory, right? He was there. Yeah, yeah and he wasn't on the card. There, right. there, you know, I imagine, you know, I mean, I I was Intercontinental Champ, so I knew I had my slot there. I know Tito wanted to wrestle me because we had just done the uh, the leg-breaking angle. But George Scott was a booker back then, and he'd like he likes he didn't want to blow it off at WrestleMania. He wanted it to go on and continue to go on afterwards. So I thought it was smart where 
he just came in and kind of stews me off for using the feet to, to beat JYD. So, um, it really, for a wrestler, he's got to look at the whole picture. And damn it, I'm not on WrestleMania one, but I mean, you can look at the picture and say, well, I'm going to be, you know, I, I'm sure that you would feel bad if you weren't because it was a big deal. You did work JYD that night. Yeah. Uh, uh, was he as tough in the ring to work with as we hear? He was kind of like pulling teeth too. Yeah. But he was such a nice guy, and uh, I could, I had, I had the secret, and not the secret that they're selling on, in the books and the movies, but I had a secret where I knew how to work with everybody. I could work around those flaws, you know. Yeah. To I made them come to my style, uh -huh. so to speak, because okay. I never did anything high risk anyway. I was just. Just get them in and, you know, and, and get them to sell and get them to where I thought it was good. And it wasn't one of my greatest matches, but he had a great comeback, and I go, let's go home, you know, because he was hard to work with. What was your reaction to this WrestleMania thing? Was it on your radar at all, even? No, and I was in. We, and we were working up north somewhere, and I, I remember standing in a bar, and they had it on pay-per-view in the bar and watching it. And and, I, and it was kind of the, not the aha moment, but like saying, you know, this is this is something different, and this is where it's, we're going. And that was something that brought them up on the radar in my mind in a whole different perspective. Because before I'd kind of dismissed them as being cartoonish, as being this, being that. But when you start putting something on that big of a playing field, kind of got to start paying attention. Yeah. Is anyone vocal in the company that we, we've got to start heading in this route? Let's get some celebrities. Let's get some cross no, no, Nothing like that. Uh, I mean, Dusty... Like I said, he definitely dreamed big. I mean, he thought he was Cecil B. DeMille's. I mean, he would dream up a movie in his head and on you know Monday night and ask us to go play it out in full on Tuesday, and with no no practice, no take two, no nothing. And that, that a lot of the stuff happened, to be honest. But as far as the bigger stage, I mean, you know, I don't want to jump ahead, but I mean that that you know we started with a simulcast. You know, they start with a WrestleMania and, and pay per view. It was. We were always like one step behind. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, they'd make a step, big leap forward. We'd make a, the best step we could with the creative minds we had, but we didn't have all the diversified people from other, you know, forms of production to, to come, kind of bring to the dance, to to put us on a level playing field, so to speak. So uh, yeah, it, it was a, it was a big eye-opening moment, it, be, beyond the fact that, uh, you know, I always felt like we had, we. we always said pride in our product that was the kind of our thing to live by we 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 left it all in the ring every night we go out there and just killed it to convince people that we had the hardest hitting most real competitive you know thing going on that you could spend your money on and and it was insane because we would go in like you said philadelphia we'd go in philly they'd be in philly the yeah. same night mm -hmm. and both of us selling out I mean, how nuts is that? How many wrestling fans are there? And, and they're two, I mean, majorly different products. It scared me to the point of saying, though, where does this go, right? We're, we're at a level of, we're, we're creating this illusion of such a level of violence. Where does this go? Are we we're going down a path to where one day we're going to paint ourselves in a corner as sure as somebody caught out on a stretcher to the hospital yeah. and then not coming back there's you know you get to some point in time and what, what's going to be the harness of this thing to slow it down a which little which you saw much later with companies like ECW and where there was no nowhere further to go with violence yeah. than, than what they were yeah. doing yeah what's Abby like behind the scenes Abby's great he's he's laid back He's a great, great person for me. I mean, he, he was absolutely incredible. And uh, I worked with him quite a bit. And Is it I, hard? Oh, no. Okay. He, he, I mean, he must have been 380 pounds back then. And 
it's on one of the Crockett tapes because I've I've seen it and I, he told me to slam him on TV and I this for I had never worked with him and I mean I picked him up and slammed him like he was Pee Wee Herman I mean he just whew, boom I mean he was such an agile big man people didn't realize what an athlete he was right. but he had great timing he he knew he knew how to get the heat uh, I was signing some some pictures somebody had of he and I wrestling in Miami. And of course, you know, juice everywhere. But I mean, he was so good at what he did. He, people believe he was just a vicious animal. And he's really, you know, for me personally and my professional you know, involvement with him, he was a big teddy bear. He was a great guy to work with. You ever eat at his rib joint? I haven't ever eaten his rib joint, but it's gotta be good. I mean, I look at him, he exactly like- <laughs> He knows his food. He's not withering away, so. <laughs>
is on that same ride, like you said. But I would imagine that is just a wild guess that uh, maybe the appeal from the ladies with some hotel keys and whatnot might be uh, bigger for maybe a Magnum TA than, a, let's say, Ivan Koloff. Well, uh, yes, and I would say that you would just have to realize that we were like a traveling band of, you know, rock star gypsies to begin with. And even before we had that, we'd created our own thing. You know, we would go to a club or a place or whatever and end up owning it before we left. I mean, you know, you got to realize you have 15 or 20 of us in there and, and the local talent doesn't have a whole lot of chance because we're not exactly yeah. shy, a little flamboyant. And, and, Rick uh, Flair at the Bennigan's yeah, in, yeah, in Charlotte? Was yeah, it yeah, I was there with Wahoo, picked up the, the Rio Grande dip and plastered it into some girl's white pantsuit too. Uh, yeah, so so anyway. That's a new one. Yeah, well, that, that was, yeah, well, it was something to do with a Pac-Man machine and a Crown and Coke. I don't remember what happened, but it was, uh, but all that to say, yes, you got a lot of attention that you wouldn't have otherwise got uh, just on your own because, yeah, you were in everybody's home. And of course, you know, it doesn't hurt to have Dusty, you know, out there continue like selling you as the loneliest man in America. You know, poor Terry, you know, poor Magnum. You know, he just can't, you know, just he's, he's just lonely, <laughs> lonely folks. <laughs> yeah, it, was just, it was ridiculous. It was it was absolutely nuts. Did you buy him nice Christmas presents, at least for those? For yeah, those well, I, 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 I did, it, I, but I didn't ever send him any of my, my legal fees that he oh. contributed to later <laughs> later in life. But, um, uh, but anyway, yes. Let's talk about TBS Studios for a minute. It was uh, it was probably safe to say ill-equipped to handle 35 wrestlers for the uh, for the tapings. I mean, you guys are like in hallways, and you didn't have adequate dressing space and back room, <laughs> uh, uh, backstage areas. I dressed in somebody's cube. I, I, a er, desk. Er, yeah, cube, yeah. I, 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 there literally there was a, a meeting room where we that would use like a green room to go over the show, and and then there was like a warehouse little area where the bulk of the guys dressed, and it was just nowhere. I would go off and find a cubicle, the unoccupied cubicle, and change clothes there. And frankly, I, I never worked, you know, typically more than 30 seconds on right. TV anyway, so it wasn't like I, you know, I needed to go take a hot shower afterwards. So uh, it, it was, uh, that was a really strange environment for me. It was mostly there about the angle, the angle, and of course, talk, your, you know, getting your character over right. through your through your interview. And, uh, it wasn't about ring time when you were there. Um, is there any fear as the as Georgia is absorbed into Crockett? Uh, is there any fear that there'll be less top spots because there's more competition now, a new band of guys? Well, the, and I, my hat's off to Dusty and Jimmy both for this because they made they created an atmosphere where every match on the card could potentially be a main would be a main event in another city so if we are running three towns in a night you could you could have so many main event caliber matches even with running three towns a night that it was phenomenal and on our what we call a super show a big show where we loaded up literally the opening match was a main event mm -hmm. we didn't have a curtain jerker now you we, we would put somebody in that match that was going to set the tone for the night but typically, you had to be on go and be able to just go wide open every night because the caliber was so high and so good. I mean, you got the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express going on before you. Well, you better, by God, light it up when you go out there next, you know. But And I, I had the luxury at that time of being not a, a rough baby face. So... Yeah, I could do all the technical flip flops and flies and stuff and the reverse this and that and the other. But they really wanted to see me get ticked off with mm. the with the bait with the heel and and lose it and and, and get real physical and, and take a fight to them. And so it gave me kind of a different flavor where I wasn't having to. I mean, we had guys like Br you know Brad Armstrong, one of the incredible technical wrestler, and guys that could just do these amazing things that defied logic, mm -hmm. but. It, but if you made them believe, you know, like I go back to John Wayne, that if they you'd been pushed as far as you could go, and then you weren't going to go no more, and they, when you came back, it was going to be horrendous on on everybody around you and <laughs> within your reach. Then that gave you a way to be marketably different. So each of us had to find a little niche to do that, you know. And 
And we had guys like Manny Fernandez to Raging Bull, who was full of fire and full of just excitement. And, of course, the Barbarian and big guys that could really, really go. And I'd, I'd put our cards in the 80s up against anything that has come before or after in terms of excitement from bell time to bell time. You know, yeah, we weren't flying off the top and crashing through tables, but we were only a, a hair from from doing that. If if somebody had said that was a good idea, guess what? We'd have been doing it. There wouldn't be any mats on the floor either because we didn't have mats on the floor back right. then. Right. <laughs> you went over and, and hit the floor, and if you, you better hope that uh, you had a room to keep going because you'd slide so far, it'd be insane. Mm -hmm. You know, when when your uh, when your uh, you know body was covered with sweat, that's what you wanted to happen. You want to hit and slide. Mm -hmm. What's Abby like behind the scenes? Abby's great. He's he's laid back. He's a great, great person for me. I mean, he, he was absolutely incredible. And uh, I worked with him quite a bit. And Is it I, hard? Oh, no. Okay. He, he, I mean, he must have been 380 pounds back then. And it's all one of the Crockett tapes because I've, I've seen it. And I, he told me to slam him on TV. And I, this for, I had never worked with him. And, I mean, I picked him up and slammed him like he was Pee Wee Herman. I mean, he just, whoo, boom. I mean, he was such an agile big man. People didn't realize what an athlete he was. Right. But he had great timing. He, he, knew, he knew how to get the heat. Uh, I was signing some, some pictures somebody had of he and I wrestling in Miami. And, of course, you know, juice everywhere. But, I mean, he was so good at what he did. He, people believed he was just a vicious animal. And he's really, you know, for me personally and my professional, you know, involvement with him, he was a big teddy bear. He was a great guy to work with. You ever eat at his rib joint? I haven't ever eaten his rib joint, but it's got to be good. I mean, I look at him, he exactly like <laughs> he knows his food. He's not withering away. So. Talk to us about uh, about Jimmy Valiant. Character certainly on camera. Uh, as colorful off camera? No. Interesting. No, just really like the most crazy thing, like somebody flick, flicking a light switch you've ever seen in your life. You talk to him off camera, and it's more like a Cheech and Chong, laid back, really mellow. <laughs> I mean, Jimmy's just mellow, mellow, Mr. Mellow guy. And, of course, he's got, you know, Big Mama, this most outrageous-looking <laughs> wife you could ever want to have. Looks like, you know, Morgana. I mean, she was just, I mean, she was, she gave new definition to voluptuous. So, you know, he's got this outrageous-looking wife. And when the cameras are off, he's, you think he's asleep at the wheel. And then they flick the switch, and he turns into the boogie-woogie man. And yeah. it does his, his, his thing and his work. And anyway, he, he, was a, he was a great guy to have, again, for diversity on your card. You wouldn't want, I don't think you'd want 10 Jimmy Valiants on a card. But, I mean, he could go out there and him and superstar Billy Graham and tear the house down. For me, it was painful to work with either one of them because I was afraid I was going to break them in half because they were so artistic in their way they worked and so light and so gentle. I mean, I was taught when you lock up, man, the sweat flies and it's like, two Brahma bulls coming together, and it's more like the dance of the dandelions, <laughs> you know, with the guy that, that works, and that's his style. It looks great. He does great things, but when you put a guy like me in there with him, it's tough. And poor Tully had to go work with Boogie for quite yeah, a, quite sure. a while, and it was kind of like he was sent off into no man's land to go work with Boogie because he was being punished because he pissed Dusty off about something. You're kidding. But, no. Tully? But, 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 I mean, you know, I felt the pain. And, it, and it's not that it it's bad. It's just different. It's just a totally different style of work. But, yeah, he was a great, great guy. Always a good friend to me. Uh, couldn't Anybody said a bad word about Boogie, I'd call him a liar. Uh, but he was, he was a good addition to have on the card. He, he, I never saw him doing, doing anything uh, that would you know, be demeaning to the group or to try to belittle somebody. He was, he was a good guy. What do you think of that concept that all of your finishes were going to be fast? I thought it was brilliant. 
Did you want to work more? Not on TV. Okay. Because I realized quickly from the business perspective that you had to, they had to want, they had to want to see you. We didn't have pay-per-view. We weren't getting, TV was nothing but an advertising piece mm -hmm. for us. And, and I had done all those kind of matches that everybody else does for years. I mean, you got to realize that even though in, in 1985, I've basically only been in the business five years, but in that five years, by today's comparison, I've had, you know, so many thousand matches you can't we we can't even fathom what that adds mm -hmm. up to. So I had seen, you know, what what it takes to go out there and just try to paint yourself as this great technician and all these things, but to make people hungry to want to see you battle somebody that they think will be a worthy competitor and pay their hard earned money and want to come out from their home, come down and sure. see you. That was the allure and Dusty knew that. He wanted to to create this 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 character uh, and, and take it to a different level where you had to come out to the venue to see me mix it up right. and do it. Sure. And that's, and that, that's what he did. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it wasn't because I got my fair share of ring time. It wasn't like I was like, you know, dying to go out and showcase this, that, and the other because, you know, frankly, you weren't, we didn't give main events away for free. You know, we might do an angle with me and Flair on TV and some sure. altercation or four man or things where they saw a little taste of it. But that's all we did. We gave them a little taste and we took it away. Yeah, the blow offs were in the houses yeah. at, at that time, sure. Were you photographed uh, in the magazine? You yeah, said? there was a. A couple of different pictures of me and Tito wrestling, and there was this one, I think it was a center, not like a center full, but it was like the center of the magazine. Uh -huh. And you see me and Tito pulling my pants, and you see the crack of my ass about this long sticking out. And uh, a couple of people asked me about that. How did you feel about that? It's the only part they showed you in the magazine. Said, well, at least I was in it. Yeah. Well, the swimsuit issue was doing so well, they <laughs> needed to get a little more ass in there, I guess. Yeah. What was this whole gorilla thing? I I don't know exactly. One of just Dusty's crazy no, things? No, I'm not sure if it was his crazy thing or it was Dick Slater's crazy thing. <laughs> Dick had some, <laughs> Dick he was a very creative guy too. And he always had a little bit of, you know, like a mixture of Terry Funk and I don't know who all else you would, you would put into a bag and shake up to get a Dick Slater. But he wanted, you know, it, Dick, had illusions or delusions that at some point in time they were going to run Georgia again like a territory, okay, like the Ole Anderson days. So they were going to run the Carolinas kind of, and then he then they were going to get a chance to like book just Georgia, and then he was going to have an opportunity to kind of do all that. And I think like two companies within well, one company. Well, like not two companies, but just a, a, another team within the team, like another place to shift people. You know, and, and work, and then he was going to have a chance maybe to, to I don't know, run that or oversee that or whatever. But I remember it was to the point where they were actually looking at office space oh. in Atlanta, and, and Dicky had, had gone out and got some prints, some pictures made up that he was going to hang in his office. So I don't know what the conversation was <laughs> going on between. I don't know if they just led him to believe something was going to happen, what was going to happen. Or, or what? But Could this have been a conversation that was going on in Slater's head? Maybe? Well, you know, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. But since you brought it up, all those things just unspun from here, and I, and I didn't make it up. So, so as far as Dicky in the gorilla suit, right. it, it, it maybe maybe it was a throwback from something in the past Dusty had done somewhere else and thought it might work. Whatever. No, I was excited about that because we were on national TV for once. I mean, really national broadcast, no cable broadcast. Pick it up with an aerial, Antenna. I thought it was great. Yeah. Um, 
NBC, did, did, they, did they interfere with what you guys were doing at all, or were you able to pretty much go out and do things the way you would Well, I had a, we had a several different matches with, uh, well, I was on NBC Saturday nights quite a few times, but the matches I really remember were against the Bulldogs, and uh, one was a two out of three, and the other one we did out in Phoenix, and they didn't interfere at all with, with the matches, they interfered with the interviews. And there were still locker room interviews, or you were back there with, with Gene, but they would give you a script of what to read. And I would try to put that in my own words, and I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And and I'd be, no, no, that's what we want, you know, because I'd try to do my own thing. That, that's one thing I didn't like. So those were the thing. NBC people that were scripting. It I, wasn't even Pat. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who did that, but nobody before told you what to say on the interviews. Right. They would say, you know, just do your own thing. Was the production team, meaning the camera uh, directors, the guys that were shooting the vignettes and producing the vignettes, were they the same guys that were working with you for WWF TV, or are these outside guys now, the, uh, NBC guys? There was some outside guys, yeah. Yeah, there were some different faces in there. Um, but we still had the main guys running the interviews, like Lanza and stuff like that. But I said, Lanza, the guy got three words here. I mean, ba ba, I'm a bo bo bo. That's all they want. That's all they want, you know. And I would argue, but I didn't like that part. Right. Um, on that card, we see uh, Orndorff's face turn. Um, what do you think about Orndorff working uh, as as a baby face after being such a successful heel? Um. It didn't last too long, did it? No, it didn't. Um, he was a babyface in North Carolina, and I used to wrestle him. And uh, um, I think, I think he was much better heel, much better heel. He was arrogant, and he, he just, it's some guys just don't make good baby faces. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you, and you guess. You know, I think I, it. I think it kind of threw a damper into um, the rest of his career. Well, if someone had come to you, you're someone also who's largely regarded as being a heel. So, uh, and can well, you say it, this is a big mistake? Can I just tell you? Do you have that kind of power to say that? Yeah, um, yeah, you do. Yeah, of course you do. If you're a big name. Like if they wanted to, they never really kind of half-assed turn me baby yeah. face. But I kept saying, you know, I should have never gone. I, I think I gave my notice. It wasn't too long after that. When you take a heel that's drawn money like that and had a lot of exposure, when you turn them baby face, it's got to be a big deal. You got to make a big deal, make a statement about it, or it's hogwash. Come back basically to put people over. Mm -hmm. um, why would he even do that? Number one, and then he was also pretty tough to work with at this at this point. I'm told he was always tough to work with. There's another guy that I made a lot of money with and, and was a very good friend with, uh, and our matches jived because I I could work. I had the ability to work around it, and I would make friends with my opponents so I could, you know, get what I wanted out of. And get that reaction. And Pedro came back in, kind of like in a tag match situation, or kind of like, I think you know, it's hard to give up this business, and and you've been on top and everything, and you take some time off and you come back, and and you want to come back because you miss it, but then you come back and you're kind of like, oh, it's not the same. You know, it, it's tough for the guys, mm -hmm. tough for a, a good man like Pedro. I couldn't believe it happened because Ken was always, you know, a great, nice guy. It must have been something like ro roid 
rage or something. Now we hear about it. We didn't know about it back then. But to, to do what he did, I mean, he just flip out and throw a big boulder through McDonald's. He wasn't thinking, obviously. And, and uh, poor Sa Saito, I knew Saito from Japan. He was kind of an innocent bystander. He was just like, you know. And they both ended up going to the penitentiary. And that, that was terrible. It really was. You guys are out there for an hour in the rain on canvas. Can you talk about just that, the dangers of that, first of all? Well, <laughs> first of all, it was supposed to be an hour Broadway. Yeah, we were supposed to go through. It started sprinkling, and it was bad. And then we're talking about 30 minutes into the match, 25, 30 minutes of the match. It starts sprinkling, and then it starts raining. Well, then it started hailing. The hail was coming down in such big balls that it was like somebody had thrown marbles out on the on the mat. Right. We'd stand up and you'd fall down. And so that's why it, Rick just tossed me over the top rope. Wow. He could, we, nobody could even hardly stand up. And the people didn't leave. They got up and put their chairs over their heads and they stood right there and watched the whole thing. And it was, yeah, yeah we, that was during, Rick and I did 19 one hour matches in a month. What's the key to a good, I've asked people before, I want your take on it. What do you got to do to go one hour comfort, if they're comfortably or, or survive, let's say? <laughs> I don't even know how to tell you now, you know, 30 years later, it, it was, uh, I mean, you, you obviously you're painting a story, you're telling a story, and you can't, you've got to have a baby face, first of all, that knows how to sell without dying, who can, mm -hmm. sell, who can sell and fight back without fully coming back. Because if you, the minute you make that full comeback, and you don't win, or you can't keep the false finishes going on right up until the the bell. Uh, the bell yeah. You've lost it, and it's got to be a back and forth battle. So Rick was kind of you know the master of that, like Dory Funk Jr. and, and countless guys that that put in that kind of time. But you know, you, you, it, it, it was it got to where I, I I don't know we could almost do it in our sleep because we we did it so much mm. but but Rick was very good and in the last five minutes it would it'd be it'd be false finishes back and forth where you know I'd have the advantage he'd have the advantage I'd have the advantage mm -hmm. back and forth back and forth right down to the end and we even had we had one really good one where Tommy Young got would get knocked down get knocked down in a move where we reverse something and as he was crawl and I would be covered in flare and Tommy would come back in, and as he was crawling, he'd be hitting the mat like he was counting, but he was really pulling himself around to where it looked like he hit three, but he was really just going over there yeah. to get get back into position, and he ended up DQing me because I hit him inadvertently when we did the some kind of reversal thing, and, the, and we did it we did it somewhere up north, and the Road Warriors were both sitting there and thought. They changed the title. They didn't even tell anybody. I mean, they flipped. The house blew up, went crazy, everything else. And then they found out that, you know, it, but boy, it hooked all of them. They were all like, like, oh, my God. But those are the kind of things you had to do when you put all that time in a yeah. match. You know, I like Bart. He was he was a good, solid worker. I mean, he, and he, he had that Texas draw thing going in an interview and and yeah he was again we were into working solid believable performances guys that appeared to be as tough as what they portrayed themselves to be in the ring and and having that marketably different product than our competitor so I didn't really question it because, again, that, that particular title was kind of a strange little title anyway because yeah. the U.S. title was the deal, right. and we kind of inherited that national title in the conglomerations with the Georgia mm -hmm. thing and everything. So it was kind of a redhead stepchild title a little bit anyway, gotcha. and yeah. it, it wasn't under the, the scrutiny. I mean, the world title, the U.S. title, and the world television title, which we made into a big deal the way they, you know, they built that up, they, they were really the three – singles titles to go after. So right out of the shoot, you know, when they go, they, they know we're going to have huge impact when we get on TBS. 
So they pit Flair and I together instantaneously, pretty much, because it just makes sense. Flair, Magnum, you know, this, this is the chase that's going on. And of course, he was the, you know, uh, again, the jet flying, you know, three piece suit, alligator shoes, all that deal. And they wanted to paint a picture that I was, you know, the America's guy, blue jeans and t shirts and Harley Davidson riding, Ford truck driving, you know, different, to, two different cultures. So that was, so his thing was, yeah, you know, he's called me Jethro Bodine and all this, this stuff and <laughs> offers me this, you know, brings me out to make me a gift of this suit. Which, uh, which I got to destroy on camera, and then belly to belly him, took the belt, yeah. and he thinks I've stolen the belt, right. but I gave, I gave it to, to Shivani. Yeah. I said, yeah. tell him I'll be coming for this in the ring. And of course, he comes out flipping out, cutting a promo as only Rick could do. And when they hand it to him, he's like speechless. You know, he's like so livid. You know, he did, he did a great job with it. But it would have, you know, it, it would have been very easy just to have gone with that momentum. But they realized there was so much more on the plate for this. They didn't want to shoot that wide off, you know, right out of the, right off the right off the get go. Right. And, and it was very smart to do so because there was a lot of other money to be still drawn with Flair in that capacity, in that light, and and, and a heel as the champion is still the best money making scenario you can have. Is Dusty the one putting all, laying all those pieces out when something like that's going to happen? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. without a doubt. Well, it was good stuff because you know it it did it, it created this this illusion of this dra you know just horribly violent thing taking place, throwing fire in somebody's face, you know it, you know and everybody knows how bad a, a burn hurts, what it feels like. I mean, short of you know throwing acid on somebody mm -hmm. or or hit them in the head with a baseball bat, that was as graphic a thing as as you could do and get a reaction. And of course, Dusty. You know how to make it look like absolutely horrendous, and got his eye all festered up looking and gook all over it, and sell it like an auctioneer for weeks at a time. First of all, how was David's performance in taking? Oh, excellent! Like and, and and believe me, Nikita, at that time was. As devastating a, a human being as you could ever step step foot in the ring with, and that's if you're on top of your game. For a guy that stands there with a microphone to say he would take that sickle, you know, uh, there, there's not enough liquid, uh, you know, anything to make me want to say, oh, I'd take that. I wear a suit. If you hit me, you know, he was 290 pounds, and he, in three steps, he could be full stride. I mean, literally, he could accelerate so quick yeah. in three steps. And just the sheer weight of in mass of his arm and his shoulder, he didn't have to try to follow through with it. He just had to launch himself, and it'd take your head off. Um, how does David come to be involved in this angle, named as the guest referee for the Great American Bash? Is this something he wants, or is this Dusty or Jim? Uh, you know, I don't know who. I wasn't really privy to that. But other than the fact that David was always that baby face announcer, would always make the little snippet comments and things that he couldn't obviously back up right you know and and, and uh you know he's the one that named me the boss and and came up with these little handles and things and he, he was good he, i mean he was good at what he did but he he interjected himself to the point where something had to happen to him he had to, somebody had to give him his comeuppance yeah. and and nikita you know obviously said okay here we go She comes into the company at whose suggestion? Is this again Dusty saying uh, she, someone who would fit? I don't, you know, I didn't know. I, I knew about it when I saw her come in. I'd never seen her before in my life. Right. I never forgot it the moment I saw her. <laughs> uh, you know, I was uh, you know 26 years old, and I don't think I'd ever seen anything quite like that. It was was a, she the real deal? She, I, I, well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't know by me. But uh, she, but you know, the thing was, she had the personality to go with the outrageous look, and she really was a good worker. She's a better worker than a lot of women in the business today, to be uh, quite honest with you. So, you know, where the ideas came from, you know, goodness knows. Everybody pitched ideas back then. You know, maybe it was Jimmy, maybe it was, who knows. But, uh, but it did make an impact, and I remember 
her in the canary yellow pants and that top looked like it got spray painted on and that big hair, it got everybody's attention. Did you or your father ever wrestle Carpentier? Yeah, my dad wrestled, and I wrestled Carpentier too. I remember he used to, he used to, I wrestled him up in Montreal and he would say, okay, when I do the comeback and you, I'll throw you in the ropes and you come straight. He'd say, come straight. And he'd have his hand, and you'd run straight into his arms. His arms were like this, boom. Come straight again. <laughs> and then he always did the gainer off the top. He always had to do that. All right. But a nice fellow. He's the one that told me, Greg, drink red wine. It's good for you. And you'll always be strong. Lots of red wine. Well, it worked for him because at 60, he's getting a squash match on WWE yeah. TV. Um, what's the story with putting him on TV cold? No build-up, no, no interview, anything. And then was it just like kind of like a favor? Uh, I think it was a favor for Dino Bravo. And uh, it was a, a way of getting into Montreal because they wanted to go into Montreal. I think it was political. Just, you know, again, we all we were tried to do was, you know, create the excitement for the fans to want to come and see us, you know, clash in the buildings and realizing that it was like, you know, these sides forming up and this is the beginning of the horsemen and all this mm -hmm. the thing is coming together and they're, you know, they're, they, I go back to Dick Slater again, I'm remembering things as, as we're talking. I mean, he had this idea, he wanted to put up like billboards with, like Dusty's picture on it and mine and Ronnie Garvin's and his, like saying, these are the four toughest men in America, you know, like like a shoot, you know, for, you know, you know, we're coming to a town near you and mm. that kind of thing. To, again, everything that would be, be 180 degrees out of the 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 cartoon that was going on as, as in our competition, that hard-hitting thing, and, and we were, you know, we were doing that in the ring every night, the angles on TV. There wasn't ever anything ha ha ish about, you know, what we did. Right. I mean, we had some window dressing things that were, you know, maybe comical. But the main event guys, it was serious, yeah. serious business all the Occasionally, time. Occasionally, Flair would be left in the underwear in the ring well, after the suit. Well, that, that, that was later. He Not back then. He, oh, okay. he, he, was, I mean, he, was, he was a hoot, but he hadn't become comical back then. The, um, that... That thing where you know going off the air, we gotta go. You know it, that kind of became a staple of that uh, that yeah. 605 show where the the schmas happens and yeah. then you lose yeah. the TV time to draw people to the house. Maybe yeah. the Omni that night yeah. or whatever. And you got 30 people in the studio that you know aren't gonna. We didn't have the internet and the social media and all that stuff, so you had to come out to find out what was gonna go on. There's a story of a bit of a fall from grace. A guy who, in 83 maybe, 82, probably could have written his own ticket. A um, lot of demons, problems. Thoughts on Jimmy? Yeah, Jimmy, I think 83. I, I came in here 79, 81, went back and forth between here and the Mid-Atlantic. And then Ray Stevens came in here and that's where they did the uh, deal with, got Jimmy going. And then, of course, Piper with a coconut in the head. And so, Jimmy, before Hulk Hogan's era, Jimmy Snooker was, I mean, my God, he was over more than anybody and jumping off that mm -hmm. steel cage of Morocco and everything. He was about as high as you could get. <clears throat> I don't mean well, maybe that you kind do. of high. Maybe I do. I don't know. <laughs> but as far as popularity and and uh, Jimmy Snooker was the man. And um, I think what, it was personal problems. I mean, that thing in Allentown, mm -hmm. and a lot of different things. And, and then he got caught coming out of uh, Israel or one of those Middle East countries with some uh, contraband on him. That's a good word for it. Um, 
kind of like made, I think it kind of made Vince nervous. Uh, Mel Phillips for a moment. He got kind of ensnared in the troubles that would uh, come to light in years, uh, a few years from then. I think 92 was when all the, the, the sex scandal stuff started coming out and that uh, his affinity for feet. Yeah, I, I heard about Never yours, I guess. No, I, my feet are ugly, I guess. But I and and not on a 15-year-old <laughs> either. Yeah, so I... I um, yeah, it was really a fun. It was just kind of like a joke. I re, I never really believed it's that uh, someone that would actually like sucking toes unless it was some Playboy playmate or something, you know. Uh, but I heard that about Mel Phillips, and um, he heard a lot of strange things. You know, a lot of strange things that happened with the Ring Boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Had you? Before we heard about this, being the general public in 92, was this always just kind of the joke, like, eh, yeah, Mel Phillips, the foot guy? Yeah. So this no, was something that was known? No one cared, you know? I mean, he wants to suck toes, let him, you know? <laughs> Nobody cared. But all of a sudden now, now, you know, nowadays, everybody cares about everything. They care, you know, they care, they, they just, the media loves any kind of scandal. And and I and I, that goes right along with our business of wrestling. Well, I, I think in, any kind in of fairness, stuff. I think the problem is that some of the kids were were, were quite young, right? Or maybe fourteen. Yeah, I did hear that, and and uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a big problem with that. And I I think before that, he was getting away with it because maybe the kids weren't that young, but then mm -hmm. he, he got some younger kids involved. Uh, Mel Phillips for a moment. He got kind of ensnared in the troubles that would uh, come to light in years, uh, a few years from then. I think 92 was when all the, the, the sex scandal stuff started coming out and that uh, his affinity for feet. Yeah, I, I heard about Never yours, I guess. No, I, my feet are ugly, I guess. But I and, and not on a 15-year-old <laughs> either. Yeah, so I... I um, yeah, it was really a fun. It was just kind of like a joke. I re, I never really believed it's that uh, someone that would actually like sucking toes unless it was some Playboy playmate or something, you know. Uh, but I heard that about Mel Phillips, and um, he heard a lot of strange things. You know, a lot of strange things that happened with the Ring Boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Had you? Before we heard about this, being the general public in 92, was this always just kind of the joke, like, eh, yeah, Mel Phillips, the foot guy? So yeah. This no, was something that was known? No one cared, you know? I mean, he wants to suck toes, let him, you know? <laughs> Nobody cared. But all of a sudden now, now, you know, nowadays, everybody cares about everything. They care, you know, they care, they, they just, the media loves any kind of scandal. And and I and I, that goes right along with our business of wrestling. Well, I, I think in, any kind in of fairness, stuff. I think the problem is that some of the kids were were, were quite young, right? Or maybe fourteen. Yeah, I did hear that, and and uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a big problem with that. And I I think before that, he was getting away with it because maybe the kids weren't that young, but then mm -hmm. he, he got some younger kids involved. Uh, Mel Phillips for a moment. He got kind of ensnared in the troubles that would uh, come to light in years, uh, a few years from then. I think 92 was when all the, the, the sex scandal stuff started coming out and that uh, his affinity for feet. Yeah, I, I heard about Never it. yours, I guess. No, I, my feet are ugly, I guess. But I and, and not on a 15-year-old <laughs> either. Yeah, so I... I um, yeah, it was really a fun. It was just kind of like a joke. I re, I never really believed it's that uh, someone that would actually like sucking toes unless it was some 
Playboy Playmate or something, you know. Uh, but I heard that about Mel Phillips. And um, you hear a lot of strange things, you know, a lot of strange things that happen with the Ring Boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Had you, before we heard about this, being the general public in 92, was this always just kind of the joke, like, eh, yeah, Mel Phillips, the foot guy? So yeah. This no, was something that was known? No one cared, you know. I mean, he wants to suck toes, let him, you know. <laughs> Nobody cared. But all of a sudden now, now, you know, nowadays everybody cares about everything. They care, you know, they care, they, they just, the media loves any kind of scandal. And, and, I, and I, that goes right along with our business of wrestling. Well, they I think, it, any it, kind in of fairness, stuff. I think the problem is that some of the kids were, were, were quite young, right? Or maybe 14. Yeah, I did hear that. And, and uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a big problem with that. And I, I think before that, he was getting away with it because maybe the kids weren't that young. But then he, he got some younger kids involved. Uh, Mel Phillips, for a moment, he got kind of ensnared in the troubles that would uh, come to light in years, uh, a few years from then. I think '92 was when all the, the, the sex scandal stuff started coming out, and that. Uh, his affinity for feet. Yeah, I I heard about never it. yours, I guess. No, I my feet are ugly, I guess, but and, and not on a fifteen-year-old <laughs> either. Yeah, so I I um yeah, it was really a fun. It was just kind of like a joke. I re, I never really believed that that uh, someone that would actually like sucking toes unless it was some Playboy playmate or something, you know. Uh, but I heard that about Mel Phillips, and um, you hear a lot of strange things, you know, a lot of strange things that happen with the Ring Boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Had you, before we heard about this, being the general public in 92, was this always just kind of the joke, like, eh, yeah, Mel Phillips, the foot guy? So yeah. This no, was something that was known? No one cared, you know, I mean, he wants to suck toes, let him, you know. <laughs> Nobody cared. But all of a sudden now, now, you know, nowadays everybody cares about everything. They care, you know, they care, they, they just, the media loves any kind of scandal. And, and, I, and I, that goes right along with our business of wrestling. Well, they I think, it, any it, kind it, of in scandal. fairness, I think the problem is that some of the kids were, were, were quite young, right? Or maybe 14. Yeah, I did hear that. And, and uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a big problem with that. And I, I think before that, he was getting away with it because maybe the kids weren't that young. But then mm -hmm. he, he got some younger kids involved. Uh, Mel Phillips, for a moment, he got kind of ensnared in the troubles that would uh, come to light in years. Uh, a few years from then, I think 92 was when all the, the, the sex scandal stuff started coming out and that uh, his affinity for feet. Yeah, I, I heard about Never it. yours, I guess. No, I, my feet are ugly, I guess. But I and and not on a 15-year-old <laughs> either. Yeah, so I, I um, yeah, it was really a fun, it was just kind of like a joke. I, re, I never really believed it's, that that... Uh, someone that would actually like sucking toes unless it was some Playboy Playmate or something, you know. Uh, but I heard that about Mel Phillips. And um, you hear a lot of strange things, you know, a lot of strange things that happen with the Ring Boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Had you, before we heard about this, being the general public in 92, was this always just kind of the joke, like, eh, yeah, was Mel Phillips, the foot guy. So yeah, this was something that was known. No one cared, you know. I mean, he wants to suck toes, let him, you know. <laughs> Nobody cared. But all of a sudden now, now, you know, nowadays everybody cares about everything. They care, you know, they care, they, they just, the media loves any kind of scandal. And, and, I, and I, that goes right along with our business of wrestling. Well, they I think, it, any it, kind in of fairness, scandal. I think the problem is that some of the kids were, were, were quite young, right? Or maybe 14. Yeah, I did hear that, and, and uh, 
yeah, there, there's definitely a big problem with that. And I, I think before that, he was getting away with it because maybe the kids weren't that young. But then he, he got some younger kids involved. Well, I'd, I'd had a tremendous run with those guys in, uh, in Mid-South, Russell and Two and I. And, you know, when I was asked about them, I said, you know, most amazing heel tag team I've ever seen. And the, and the guy that's got the stick can make you want to kill him if you've never seen him before in your life. I mean, anybody. When you walk down the street, never seen him, you see him, he, you know, he needs somebody to put a boot in his rear end. And so they were a perfect match. And, and uh, you know, Dennis Connery was a master of reg technology, and Bobby Eaton could do anything. So those two guys coming in was just like to the moon. I, I mean, the talent that was being drawn into this is like a tornado going on, and we're sucking the beer, the marrow out of all the real major league talent in the country that, that realizes that the territories are going away, and we don't run to this ship. The flood's coming, and we're going to be sunk. So everybody wanted to be on this ride, and, and when they came in, you know, I knew I, I knew every every time a, a new character stepped in that was from another successful past I had, that was going to do nothing but take our product up another mm -hmm. notch. What what was this? What was the hillbilly thing? Was it as over as? I they guess, wanted us to believe it was? I guess Vince was just, it, it was becoming like a circus back there in the dressing room. You had alligators and dogs and parrots and all kinds of stuff in the background. You had hillbillies and, you know, it was just, it was like a, it really was like a three-ring circus. Like, and you had these hillbillies who I thought couldn't draw you a, a dime, but... Uh, you know, to pad the card out and stuff like that, I guess they, they had a place. And who can forget the um, infamous Uncle Elmer wedding when his wife got nailed with one of those little bottles you get on the airplane. What did you make of going out there? Uh, did you feel kind of naked going out to California, or did you think the TV coverage that um, TBS was giving you was enough? You know, I, I didn't expect to walk in everywhere and sell out overnight just because we were on TBS, because I knew that there was other contributing factors to, to you know, you would have to look at the demographics of what, what had been good out there, what is the where's the barbin set you know do they does somebody else go out there and run five six thousand people on average and we've gone in and done less than half or or what is it so it was kind of a foreign soil thing to me i didn't really take it any different than i did when i walked into dorfic scope my home for the very first time and saw you know maybe 1500 people in there when you look like you'd shoot a shotgun off and not hit anybody to me it was just the first step in a venue that uh, had never seen our product before. Are you able to uh, very easily give as much to the match as if there were 15,000 people, or is there a palpable, noticeable difference in your performance in the ring? I don't think there's any, any difference in the match. I think there's a, it's a different kind of match because you've got to work harder painting the picture a different way. But, see, I came from, from that old school where you know, we might be wrestling in a little podunk place in Louisiana. They, during the day is a restaurant, and at night it's a bar, and they set a ring up in it. And we went out there and, and put in 20 or 30 minutes with with a you know a green guy, and and it, it would end up making it into a main event you know match and get color and everything else oh. that you can imagine. So, yeah, no, to me it, w it wasn't anything tainted yet because we were still we were still climbing and we were still trying to take this thing to this next level because I knew we weren't there yet I knew it was going but we weren't where we ultimately would be mm -hmm. if given the right opportunity uh, Mel Phillips for a moment he got kind of ensnared in the troubles that would 
uh, come to light in years, uh, a few years from then, I think 92 was when all the, the, the sex scandal stuff started coming out and that uh, his affinity for feet. Yeah, I, I heard about Never it. yours, I guess. No, I, my feet are ugly, I guess, but... I and and not on a 15-year-old <laughs> either. Yeah, so I, I, um, yeah, it was really a fun, it was just kind of like a joke. I, I never really believed it's, that uh, someone that would actually like sucking toes unless it was some playboy playmate or something, you know. Uh, but I heard that about Mel Phillips. And um, you heard a lot of strange things, you know, a lot of strange things that happened with the Ring Boys and stuff like that. <laughs> Had you, before we heard about this, being the general public in 92, was this always just kind of the joke, like, eh, yeah, Mel Phillips, the foot guy? So yeah. This no, was something that was known? No one cared, you know. I mean, he wants to suck toes, let him, you know. <laughs> Nobody cared. But all of a sudden now, now, you know, nowadays everybody cares about everything. They care, you know, they care, they, they just, the media loves any kind of scandal. And and, I, and I, that goes right along with our business of wrestling. Well, I they think, in, any in, kind in of fairness, stuff. I think the problem is that some of the kids were, were, were quite young, right? Or maybe 14. Yeah, I did hear that. And, and uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a big problem with that. And I, I think before that, he was getting away with it because maybe the kids weren't that young, but then he, he got some younger kids involved. Prior to Vince launching his WWF magazine, which was all produced in-house and everything, did you guys have to contact Apter or, or Stu Sachs, Stanley Weston actually before that, um, to get yourselves in the magazine? Did you provide them pictures? What kind of relationship did you have with the magazines? Well, Bill Apter and George Napoliano. I think. Napolitano, yeah. Okay. Couldn't pronounce that right. I'm not from Italy, but they, they came up, <laughs> they came up to uh, Albany, New York when I was wrestling for the uh, NWF Federation out of Buffalo just to do a story on me. And this is like 72 or three after I just started because of being Johnny Valentine's son. I got to know those guys, and, and then when I got my first break uh, with Flair in the Mid-Atlantic in 77, they, um, they really put, they treated me really good in the magazines. And of course, in 1979, when I got up here and got a big push in the WWF, uh, they were all over me, and I went down to their, their um, I don't know where we did it. I think they had a place in Long Island or something, and they did all those tons and tons of pictures of me, and they always took care of me right away. And I think that really helped me, uh, uh, I mean, get over all over the world because that's that's great press, and people love those wrestling magazines, at least back then, and they were competitive. They weren't all the same, except for the apartment house wrestling with the girls. They all, but... Uh, you know, I, I got a lot of covers, a lot of cover shows for them. Were the interview portions of those a work? Like, were they were they kind they, of writing they, the quotes? Yeah, they made all that up. Okay. Yeah. Do you ever was there any relationship where you'd reward them in some way, send a bottle of wine, a check, something? For, no. For a particularly good story. I think Ric Flair did. No, I don't know. Off the record. Uh, but no, they're, they're, we were just good buddies. This feud is, is documented well in my side of the story, available at www.kfabecommentaries.com. So we've heard already a lot about your feelings for Tito um, as a person um, and as an opponent. Who comes to you to propose the title switch back? Um, well, um, I knew I knew that. Uh, that uh, you, you have to, you know, I had it 10 months, I knew that was coming pretty soon. And uh, I thought in my mind, usually when I lose a title, I get it back again. So I just, you know, we're going to trade, I'll get, I didn't know it was bye-bye forever. 
But uh, then they told me about the tag team thing about a month before I dropped the belt, so I felt good about that. So um, uh, leading up to it, I uh, did all I could to make it, uh, you know, a real good build up and the interviews and everything building up to Baltimore. Um, I didn't care it wasn't Madison Square Garden or some other bigger city. Baltimore was a great wrestling town and it was a good town for me. And being in the cage and stuff and, and the finish and everything where I got knocked out by the cage and Tito went down, I thought all that, you know, was, was heads up and it was, you know, it was to my liking. I really enjoyed it. Whose finish was that? Was a, a very, a very famous finish where Tito's coming down the outside. You're coming out the door. He kicks the door. We were kicking it around trying to figure out. They didn't want a pinfall um, in the middle. They didn't, you know, you try to get a winner without hurting either guy. You know, and they didn't want to hurt me. And um, I really think, and it's one been a long time ago, but I think Monsoon had. He, for some reason, he was there, and uh, I, I think, I think it was his idea. Well, Tito, why, when you come down, Greg be going out. Why kick that cage and boom? I go back like that, and you dropped it. It was monsoon, yeah. yeah. God rest his soul. It was monsoon. That was, and I loved that finish, and and the, and the match was great too. It was, you know, it was it was a good close to a long long feud we had. And then you lock yourself in the cage and destroy the, the belt to, I destroyed to the keep belt. the heat. And, and that was their idea because they were going to make a new belt anyway. Now, if I'd known how much that belt would be worth right now on eBay, I wish I would have kept it. And for the record, on our My Side of the Story disc, when we ask Tito where the belt is, he embarrassingly enough says, I threw it in the garbage that night. Oh, my God. And he also said that if he only knew... He would have held on to it. So it hit the trash pail at the uh, Baltimore See, Arena. That would be worth a fortune now. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it was a it was a good end for that for that run with Tito and probably enjoyed I probably made more money and had more of a good time with that with that angle. Other than me and Ronnie Garvin beating the hell out of each other, I, which I enjoyed. You know, I really, really loved that. With Tito. Well, Tito could give it as tough as he took it, which is one of the things that you look for. He's a tough guy, yeah. too, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I met the guy in 1972. I was already wrestling in Elkhart, Indiana. And he came into the dressing room, he was playing baseball, or trying to play baseball. And I remember meeting him, and boy, he, he went along, he, he paid his dues. I mean, it, there's like, from 1972 to 85, mm -hmm. so there's 14 years, 13 years, where he blazed the trail over there in Tennessee and Kentucky and that. and. Uh, um, I, you know, when I see a guy that paid his dues, get a chance, you know, and he was, he was actually the first one to have a, a lady manager, I knew it was gonna, it was gonna get over. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah. Um, how did he fit in the locker room? Was he uh, an outlaw kind of, or did he blend? No, in he was very person? quiet, and he he moved, ended up buying a house right down, about a mile from me in, in Tampa, Florida, or St. Pete, Florida. They're a very nice guy. Elizabeth used to come over all the time, visit with my wife, and um, he was he was fine at the beginning, you know. Do you think that that music, because this would happen again in, in in other places, but also here, do you think that musical performances take anything away from the wrestling portion of the card? Are they an ill fit, or is the added draw worth it? It's not worth it. I mean, we proved it wasn't worth it because we brought some big-name talent out to some places where even that big-name talent all by themselves should have drawn better than what we drew. We did that stadium tour, and we were in huge stadiums. It would hold just huge numbers of people, and you put 10,000 people in one of those 
monster stadiums and it looks horrible. So we had that whole stadium tour thing going on with uh, David Allen Coe and uh, I can't even remember the whole list of you know country stars that we had, but it it wasn't no it, it wasn't a good fit it wasn't a good flow of energy because people that come to a wrestle match they want to see they want to be entertained they want it hard hitting they want to get to see their favorites go against their their, their most hated and they want it kind of go like this they don't really care about sitting there and people that go to a concert just want to go sing and drink beer and have fun and do what they do at a concert so it, it wasn't. It, no, it, it, to me, I think we missed a mark on that. I think it's something that looked good on paper, mm. but I think quickly, you know, it was a success in Charlotte. But the minute we took it to Nashville and we took it to uh, uh, JFK Stadium, we took it to some other places. I think we, you know, we realized we spent some money that we'd taken that same amount of money and invested it into some other way of, of publicity or whatever. We could have probably had a better house. Remember hopping on stage and singing that night? Oh yeah. With well, I've sang, well, I've sang with David Allen Coe and Willie Nelson and a cast of God Only Knows Who because Dusty was a big, big uh, a fan of, uh, of Willie Nelson. And I we did, uh, we, we would go out there sometimes on New Year's Eve with him when he used to do the show in uh, Houston and uh, go on stage with him and sing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, re I remember those days. I got a picture of it somewhere. Kamala was great, and even though it, you know, and he was somebody destined to go on to do even greater things in, in the WWE, uh, he, he still let me do a belly to belly on him after the match and lay him out. And uh, even though it wasn't a, you know one two three in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, you know he did he did me a favor still. You know taking he was a 380 pound again monster and lets me belly to belly him in the center of the ring and laid out and sold it like he'd been hit by a freight mm -hmm. train. So. Uh, it was a good match, and, and I'd worked with him a little bit, too, in uh, Mid-South, so I had some experience with him. And, and it was good because you had to know how to, the guy, the gimmick guys, you had to know how to work with them because you weren't going to do the typical tickles and tackles and drop down yeah. kind of match. You had to be able to work with those big guys different. And Dusty was a different guy, but he knew how to work with all those freaks of nature mm -hmm. and, and different kind of people. And you, you learn quickly, you better learn how to work with anybody and everybody. I learned mm -hmm. that from Adrian Street and, mm -hmm. and working with him when I was very young at the business. But you had to be able to put over whatever that other person's gimmick was to make it believable and sell it so they can in turn make you. Is there a risk when two teams are maybe too similar? If you've got four power guys or Four high flyers in the ring is is too much of similar a problem. For me, it is, and and you can't have too much of something. It'd be like having two, the two strongest men of the world. If that's their gimmick, and they're both super strong. Somebody's got to come out the lesser of on the tail end of that. Any way you any way you turn it, because uh, I mean somebody's got to get come out with having been viewed by the fans as having some type of, of an advantage over the other team. So you got two styles the exact same and, and it's, a, it's a tough sell. Uh, the, the Russian powerhouse thing, of course, you know, that, that took was, you know, coming to take a shift as Nikita became a singles anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, things kind of changed on that a lot. But, you know, the Road Warriors to me were like a great big attraction, like Andre used to be when mm -hmm. Andre came. You, you wouldn't ever think about having Andre on your card, you know, 52 weeks a year, but Andre would come in and work a couple of weeks and help settle some grudges and do some different things and go on to the next place. You had to have a great big sphere of places to work to utilize somebody that big all the time. But what happened to me, like with the Road Warriors, when they came blasting on the Superstation and would do some things and come in and, you know, just be bigger than life, it was come, you know, straighten up some bad things that were going on or whatever. And it was exciting and you saw them and then you could maybe see one more match after that. And that was good. Road Warriors, 52 weeks a year, mm -hmm. working a program, then it's hard for them to be the Road Warriors. Like you can't be, you know, the big gun and be vulnerable. 
and and, and be subjected to the things of more men, mere mortal men mm -hmm. <laughs> as we as we do down in the trenches and it, and it took takes a little something off so yeah putting two big powerhouse teams together yeah that takes something off bringing them in all the time yeah that takes something off too you would tag with them uh, frequently um, how were they to work with oh great yeah. I mean uh, Joe and, and uh, Hawk were super uh, to uh, be in the ring. Well, I worked against them when I was at Mid South. Uh, Jim Duggan and I wrestled against them uh, several times there. It, but be, as far as being partners with them, it was a night off. It was just like being, you know, being out there in Disney World for me. They're throwing people six feet through the air and everything. I, I'd come in and do a few things, and I'd set the heat, give somebody a hot tag, and we'd go into a six-way and go home. <laughs> How about uh, Ellering? Paul was great, too. And Paul, you know, Paul had good timing. He wasn't just window dressing. Paul was a great worker all, all by himself uh, back when I saw him first back in the early 80s when he was still wrestling before he got injured. Uh, I mean, he was, what a great physique and impressive guy Paul Ellering was. Talked great. You had a... a he was a great addition and mentor to that group because they really, you know, talk about having two 300-pound pit bulls on a chain. Mm. Somebody needed to guide them, and they really did, didn't need to just be left alone by yeah. themselves. May not play well with others, that kind of thing. They they needed somebody to kind of keep them out of the ditches, and that was a full-time job with one of them. there danger in being Booker and talent and a champion where you're going to draw some scrutiny naturally from other people? Hands down, absolutely yes. But what do you do? So you got this guy with this real creative mind who happens to also have another persona that's a talent that can also draw money. And, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't have ever wanted to be Dusty for the simple reason that he was good at leading people and, and doing what he needed to do as a booker, but he still was young enough that he still had lots of years left of being a performer in the centerpiece. And if I'm a booker, if I take myself out of that talent's head for a minute and I'm a booker and I say, okay, I got this guy, this guy, this guy, who am I going to put into bat here or who am I going to put in play this position? I'm going to use that guy that's a, that, that's a good player. He's still a good ball player, and I'm going to do something good with him. So Dusty... You know, put himself in situations where you know people would argue that, oh well, he did that. He's got this. He's got the pencil. He's gonna put it somewhere he wants. But he produced. Yeah, he still. He never went. I, I've never seen Dusty go to the ring and give anything less than 100 percent. Never seen him take shortcuts. That you know, he didn't take back drops and do this and do that and the other. But he worked hard and he worked smart and he had the Eddie Graham psychology going in that head all the time. And he knew how to make those people come out of their seats wanting to come in the ring to help him. And 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 for a baby face, that's what you have to be able to do. Ricky Morton, one of the best examples mm -hmm. in, the, in the world. A baby face has got to be able to sell like an auctioneer, and but them also believe that he can come back and beat that dirty, rotten scoundrel mm -hmm. if he just gets a chance. You know? yeah. And Dusty you know, did that every night. Do you think Nikita held his own against uh, uh, against Rick? I mean, he's he's somewhat inexperienced at the time, and this is a huge show. How did he do? He did as good as he was capable of doing at that stage in his career. That's what he did. He did everything that he was capable of and then some. Rick had the ability to to showcase people beyond their ability, their own abilities. But there's sometimes you can't guide and you can't put the person in the right place. And, and at those points in times, the person is exposed because they don't have that partner that can lead them, mm. you know, lead them through it. So uh, was it premature in the big scheme of things? Yeah, it was premature. Uh, was, it of, was it of interest? Yeah, it was big mm. interest because he's a big, impressive-looking guy. But they still hadn't really gotten to know what Nikita was all about at this point in time. He was just a big... You know, scary looking guy, but they really didn't know what the Russian nightmare character was really all about. He really hadn't been developed quite as much as he as he would be in the upcoming months. 
Some of the criticism you hear uh, surrounding Nikita at the time was that he didn't sell enough for baby faces. Did you ever find that to be true? When he was a baby face? Now, no, selling for, selling for the baby face. Well, he was doing what he was told. Okay. Okay, he was, they, they made him into a monster. And he, I mean, he sold for me. Uh, and, but again, I may, we, want, we wanted to make him seem almost indestructible and dastardly and at the same point, but, but he, it's, it's a fine line there. You got to make him so scary you're, you're afraid nobody can beat him, but if he's so good just nobody can beat him, and then is he just a jerk that nobody likes, but really he can beat anybody and do it cleanly? The thing, we, the thing that was hard for him to understand is even though you're so strong and everything else, you still got to use uh, bad, dastardly tactics. You still got to circumnavigate the rules to get advantage, even though you're strong, so strong and mm. so fast and so whatever. A baby face has got to be able to frustrate a heel of that magnitude to the point where he loses it and you know, grabs the hair or takes the cheap shot when yeah. the referee steps through and whatnot. And Nikita was just green as green as grass. I mean, he was, and stiff, oh, hmm. goodness gracious. It, not because he was trying to be, he just couldn't, he just didn't move. I mean, it's like grabbing a hold of a steel bar and say, oh, I'm going to bend your arm up here. Right. Well, you are if I let you, but you are, if not, you going to go. I mean, he did one-arm dumbbell curls with 90-pound dumbbells back in those days. He was, a, he was just a beast. There's a near riot after this match, after the Russians are triple-teaming Flair and being him. Do you remember how serious it got in the, uh, in the venue? I've, well, I don't remember that particular instance, but you know, uh, I was just talking with Baron Von Raschke because he was part of that same era and time, and I remember them doubling and tripling up on, on me at different times and seeing people coming in the mm -hmm. ring and having to be, you know, throwing them back out and stuff. So, yeah, that they, they were there. That whole little group was carrying just an enormous amount of heat, and that's when, you know, this pride in America and the Russian. Con, you know, conflict and them putting down America. That's when it was really, uh, it was a fashionable thing mm -hmm. for to do as a heel. And they were making, uh, you know, making a good payday out of uh, bashing Americans. He's a nice guy, a little strange. Uh, Randy is strange too, but Lanny is stranger. And I'd rather not go on the record saying how strange he is. Well, there is some debate, and a question we often ask sometimes when we bring up the two names is who's the otter brother? And so there's an answer it'd, it'd finally. Be, yeah, it would be Lanny. Yeah. yeah. He used to do a lot of contortionist tricks. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's confirmed. Okay. Yeah. Well, I saw it. I saw his yeah. tricks. It could have been, he could have made millions. In, in a different industry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, no. Not for <laughs> special <laughs> films. Yeah, special films. Films in uh, Finkel's. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, my question was how. Uh, Randy was on the fast track to, to main event status, no question about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lanny, with the exception of the a small push later on as the genius and stuff, um, it was very clear, I guess, to him that he would be working the lower portion of the card. It was a, and this is what I know because when, in WCW, when Randy went there, he got, he says, you got to take care of my brother, and he got a contract, and Lanny never even saw the squared circle there. He just got a check every week or every two weeks. So, I mean, Randy at least took care of his family. You know? So this was an agreement, listen, if I come up to work with you? Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm not saying that Lanny, I mean, Lanny, we all know that Lanny would not be a main event draw anywhere because he's just not like that. But he could do a lot of athletic stuff and, and you know, he's a good support for the card. I would, you know, I would hire him. I know my dad hired him just to see his tricks in Tampa.
they, as pretty much everybody else that came after me from Mid-South, talked to me on the phone, said, you know, Terry, is this for real? Is this really the real deal? Is this, you know, the, the, the promised land of what we're, you know, about to do? And, and, and we all, you know, we talked. We all talked amongst ourselves because we had very tight group in Mid-South. And, uh, yeah, they knew they were coming, and they knew they were going to get, you know, biggest push they'd ever had in their life. And, uh, and you know, to immediately go into a program with the Midnight, I mean, that's it, that was the design from day one. Right. And, uh, yeah, that, it was uh, it, it was perfect timing because they brought the they brought a whole different genre of people of of interest. They the little girls from six say, years yeah. old to fifteen years old mm -hmm. coming out of their minds over Ricky and Robert. I mean, they would just lose their minds. So when you you know we were appealing to you know eighteen to thirty five year olds strong, but we didn't have that little kid. Mm piece of it in the, in the in the little you know like the pre-teens and early teenagers we didn't have that piece of the puzzle covered and boy when we brought that around you know that that filled the gap because then they can't come without the parents right. so you're, you're, you're you know, i mean your yeah. revenue your revenue doubles right off the bat um considering the increase in uh the female fan base besides ricky and robert whose careers benefited uh the most from adding that that demo also well I, I i guess man i don't understand the question everybody benefits with the rent with the gates go up well sure but i mean with uh i mean with a strong with an in, in addition of, a, of an entire uh, demographic to the fan base now you're maybe they're wanting more posters in the oh, magazines well, yeah, from well, you so well, the mar from marketing perspective yeah. oh yeah hands down because now you've got a group this program that way and they want you know, they're the teen idol, you know, right. kind of folks. And, yeah, absolutely. And that's another place we flopped majorly because we were trying to do all that in-house with, without getting any, you know, somebody thinking outside the box of marketing. Uh, we, we just missed the boat entirely on how we should have been able to capitalize on marketing opportunities mm -hmm. for, for, for sales. I mean, we, we, we picked up all the low-hanging fruit and things that came in pretty easily, but we didn't have anybody thinking about it on a global scale like the WWE did. Right. Ricky and Robert getting the titles on their first night in. Okay? Perfect. Perfect. Could have, they, they, they were too good to, to do anything but do that would have been a slap in everybody's face. Because you didn't want, the minute you saw them and saw their timing and how fast they were and how much electricity was going on, I mean, everybody, everybody else short of the midnight would have had to turn their game down five notches to even get the ring with them. Right. So, you know, they, it, that was just a no-brainer. I, got, I had a great friendship with Dino, but when they put us together as a new dream team, um, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know if I was just pissed that they broke, well, I was pissed that they broke me and Brutus up. Um, I just didn't, the tag team thing, I just didn't like it, and they had a stupid angle for us to do, carrying a, a, a um, a leash around with no dog in it, like supposedly stole the bulldog. And I'm a serious wrestler, and I just, I said, this is bullshit. I don't want to do that. Maybe I'm, you know, I should have been a politician and uh, and went along with it, and we probably would have been the world tag team champions, but I, I just didn't want to do it. And Dino had a horrible temper, and every morning he would beat on the car steering wheel, and. It was just like, it was too much drama for me. And I I just had a meeting with McMahon and Patterson, just asked to get out of that situation. Was, but, um, you know, I, I loved Dino. I mean, he had a bad, but I loved him. And, and him getting killed like that was, was awful. The uh, WWE coming and taking over the Montreal promotion at this time, um, 
well, we know your feelings on Canada already, but did you see it as a good thing for further expansion, a new market, big house from Maple Leaf Gardens, of course? Yeah, and that was kind of a Dino thing with me and everything. I didn't realize the political thing. I should have just kept my mouth shut. But, uh, um, yeah, that's what they wanted. They wanted, they saw Montreal as a big, big city, which it is, but a big draw. They, they just wanted that. You worked with him and you worked with Flair a lot in 85. Uh, compare and contrast their styles for me. Well, before I do that, let me tell you what really happened that night okay. was the greatest dead white heat I have ever heard in my entire life. She came out of nowhere dressed as a police officer. Right. Hands him a roll of quarters, and I'm taking him pillar to post. You know, I mean, you know, and everybody just knows that you know I'm going to just take him out again. And when he hit me with that thing, the quarters go flying everywhere. They just ping, 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 ping. They're flying everywhere. And I go out like I've been hit by a freight train. And he, one, two, three, and I don't move. I'm, I laid out for 10 minutes. That place went just stone cold. Man. Oh, I, that is the biggest heat. Not, I'm going to just flabbergasted, white, we're gonna. He, somebody's gonna die. This is the worst thing imaginable. Heat I've ever seen happen in just an instance, with that one move and that set up everything we were do going forward. I never got to work that kind of angle with Flair because all we did was we were building a house. We were going around the territory building the house. We were showcasing the kind of competition that you were gonna see when you saw a world title match in the NWA. Or said, this is what the world champion means in in our land. We don't go this and that and spend 15 minutes walking down the ring and you know doing all these things. Or, you know, that, that's great. There's, we got the boogie woogie man, right? We don't have to all do that. It's certainly not in a world championship match. So Flair and I, I never got to do a truly dastardly heat type angle with Rick. Right. To, to really give him the opportunity to be shown in that light. Was he capable of doing it? Absolutely. But he just, the world's title wasn't being used that way at that time. Right. But their styles. Styles are, Flair's work was was great, but it's predictable. It was, it was like watching a routine, kind of. If you work with Rick, Two or three times, you could almost do it with your eyes closed. Cause Is it that was, better or worse for you as an opponent? As as a as an opponent, then it was better. Today it would be worse, because we only had to worry about a few marks, maybe driving from town to town to back the then. Same match, yeah. Today, you couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, you absolutely you would if you didn't change it up and, and mix it up and and fresh it up. It they'd get they the fans would be called the spots for you. Mm-hmm. Right, that's true. But 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 polar opposite of Tully is like throwing a stake out there in the middle of the between two dogs and jumping on it with him, it was just a fight. It was it was hard it was fast paced, hard hitting, I mean, up in your face. He he made you pull your game up because he was just on it. Mm. I don't think I ever saw him run out of gas one time my entire life when we went 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, it didn't matter. Right. Yeah, different different animal. Uh, Go drank, ahead. Drank every drop of alcohol on the plane. I was going to, the nine, first thing I was going to ask you. Nine, nine hours of us all on one plane. Wrestlers on a plane it never ends well. Uh, uh, do you remember this trip? Oh yeah, I, I I I was able to take a nap in the middle of it, and then start then wake up and join the second half of it. Uh, it was uh, oh, and I took my dad with me. I had my dad on the plane. Good <laughs> lord! So yes, we did. We just had all the whole first class taken over, the whole balloon plane. It was like a party in the sky. It could never happen in a day's time. We had no. all been we had all been all been locked up. Was Flair uh, doing the road? Yeah, gimmick? Flair did the road gimmick. Okay. You know, 
the the but the stewardesses are all playing along and with it you know and, Good for them. yeah there's no uh there's no ruffled feathers going on anywhere uh as a matter of fact so we but then we get there then we land <laughs> and then jimmy crockett is in rare form and we walk in and lars anderson's there and, and something <laughs> was said that just ruffled some feathers and jimmy said you, you know what we'll just go home it, and it literally, you know, like not get dressed, nothing. We'll just go out, have dinner, and fly back home. And I don't even know what went wrong. But it was like the dressing room, their side came up. We had all walked in. There was like 30 of us. And somehow somebody made a peace treaty deal somewhere, and, and we all worked. And we wrestled in uh, the, the Aloha Stadium. And I think yeah. when Dusty and I went in the ring, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, our time here. Mm. And, uh, and 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 it you know it, it was a big big event. It was a, there were so many matches on the card. It was you, nobody could really do anything. I mean, we had a six man match. And we had eight minutes or something to have a six right. man match. Yeah. So it was a crazy experience. And then we're back on a plane at six o'clock the next day, flying back. So you know, really the Hawaii experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, according to the reports here, Lars throws a, a coke in Jim's face and and backs him up against the wall, um, while Bruiser Brody is shouting for Lars to deck him. Crockett threatened to pull the wrestlers and leave. Did you see a physical altercation, or it was just verbal? Never saw it, but my gosh, we were all just lucky to be there. I mean, it was you know nine hours of solid yeah. on a plane, and and what we just went through and. All I know was it was like it was like something out of a bad movie, in, in a in a gang war, a street gang war getting ready to take place, and we had pretty nasty group with us that wasn't in the best of spirits to begin <laughs> with, and I really didn't know what was gonna I didn't know which way it was gonna go I didn't know we were just throw our stuff down and get after it with them in the dressing room and leave or what was gonna happen. It's reported that Giant Baba meets with you and Dusty backstage. Is it true? No. Okay. Uh yeah, if he did, that's my truth because that's what I remember. So that means that's true because I don't remember having met. So John Baba up there, whatever, I, I don't remember being. See how these things get started? Yeah. Absolutely off the cuff was, oh, really? pl was, was, was planned like on the drive down there. Oh. Doug Dillinger brought it, brought his police, gave me his police uniform, and I stopped and bought a set of a pair of Foster Grants at the drugstore, pulling in there, and uh, we did that deal, and I put my hair all up in that in that hat, <laughs> and nobody knew who I was. It was the neatest flippant thing, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously I was pretty well known at that point in time, and I walked to the ring, and nobody even wiggled. Nobody was like going, ah, it's Magnum. No, no. I mean, I had the hair all up, the thing down, the shades on, the belt on with the nightstick and all the stuff and the, and the deal. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was exciting. It, it just shows you how a little thing that seemed like what a big deal and, and, and the people lost their minds. Very quiet, very nice, and of course, I, I said earlier, we, 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 uh, they moved right near me down there in Florida, and uh, she was always very, very quiet, very polite. You wouldn't think, you wouldn't think uh, anything bad would come out of that. I guess something did eventually, but uh, she's very meek. Yeah. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. Was Randy's overprotective nature that we hear about? Was that in effect right from the get-go when she first appears on TV, or is that just something over time? Maybe she was mistreated by the boys or whatever. I don't know how that developed. I know that he kept her in the dressing room locked, and then, you know, if I had my wife uh, with me, I mean, she would go in there and visit with her, but he really, really uh, didn't want any of the boys around her. I just, I think that was his nature. I know when he didn't take her on the road, um, she would be at home 
and she wouldn't be allowed to, and now I heard this, but maybe it isn't true, that she wouldn't be allowed to go to the store by herself. She had to go with his mom and dad or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's just what I heard. The other managers that are there, the other 74 managers on the roster at the time, uh, do they feel that the spotlight's being stolen again a little bit? Probably, yeah, I definitely would. And a, and a, and a good looking lady like that, you know, and yeah, I think she kind of took the spotlight away from her, all the managers. Whose idea would something like this be to bring in someone's spouse? Is it a request Randy makes? Is it something that George Scott cooks up? Or Vince or I think they all cooked it up together and I think Randy Randy wanted it. He wanted to bring her in. To keep an eye on her. Keep her on the road with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they've been uh, grooming beefcake with Hogan and and they've been putting him in matches with me where I was a single champion and, and uh, he would be with me in different tag team things. And, and George Scott and I were, were close, good friends from Charlotte. And he told me more or less that he was wanting me to teach Brutus how to work. And, and, and Brutus and I became friends and then they decided to uh, do the tag team belt thing and it, and it got over real well. How was Brutus as a partner? I thought he was great because to make a tag team work, you got to have one guy as the captain and one guy that takes orders or, or is greener than the other guy. And it worked for us because, you know, Brutus had been working quite a long time, but not nearly as long as I have or had the main event exposure. So he would listen to me and, and it worked out well. Um, why did they so quickly end their tag run before they had even wrapped up the Intercontinental thing with you? Um, was it just to get the titles off? I know Wyndham was being a little unreliable at the time. Was it just a desperation thing to get the titles off of them quickly? I don't know. I, I know they wanted to do the switch in Philadelphia. Uh, I don't know if Wyndham was having a problem yet then or not. I think they, they really wanted to work this angle, the American boys against us, or whatever they called them. And uh, it was about a week later uh, where Barry saw us in downtown Baltimore and, and we were playing like bumper cars in the street. He's running his Lincoln into our Lincoln and, and Rotundo. And, and so the, the next morning I heard that they both flipped out, got on an airplane and flew back to Florida. And so they ended up firing both of them and that's where the Bulldogs came in and that's when we went and did that angle and put them over in a non-title match on TV and they instantly got over it. Otherwise they were just underneath like the Hart Foundation. But that's how that all came about. But then they ended up bringing Rotundo back because Rotundo was really kind of the innocent bystander and they put him with Dan Spivey and they tried to recreate that thing again. But it didn't work uh, because Spivey did, was no Barry Wyndham. Right. Great guy, but no Barry Wyndham. Johnny V, what comes to mind when I say the name? Just a real funny guy, lots of laughs. Uh, I thought they did him wrong by letting him go, and, and they fired him as our manager. I hated that. Um, I thought he was, you know, he did the cigar, and he... He never was really that serious, but he still, you know, I thought it was money. I thought he was money. I thought he was box office. And, um, you know, I, I understood that him and Vince knew each other from college or something. Oh, that I didn't know. Yeah, and uh, so to see him not get his credit where credit's due, it's kind of sad. The, uh, the finish of that match is a lit cigar into Wyndham's eye. Uh, who, well, I hated that finish. Who, so I was going to ask you, who came to you with that? Apparently that was George, you know, George Scott was a good friend of mine and a good finish man. And when he gave me that finish, I said, but apparently it got over, you know, it shows you what I know, you know. Maybe that dog collar thing with the, 
well, the Bulldogs would have got over too. That was just, but you know, to win a, a big title like that with a cigar in the eye, I just thought it could have been thought out a little. I, I thought maybe you could do that, but then do something else on top of that. But that became the main focus. And, but they left anyway, so it didn't matter. Right. The Bulldogs emerged as probably one of the hottest tag teams ever, and we, and we were instrumental in getting them going. When they do these state fairs, they're uh, booked like six months ahead of time, and they just throw out a main. They just throw big names together. That's how they would do that. Because I was already beaten as an intercontinental champion. I think I was in tags then. But it's still, you know, you throw their names together, and it meant something. But this, these attendances that these things are doing, thirty thousand. I remember. I remember ridiculous. that when you mentioned. It, I remember it like yesterday. It was. It was outdoors, and as far as you could see, it was people. And it, but they were standing up, sitting down. It was like, just, you know, you look, it looked like uh, like uh, Woodstock. Woodstock, Woodstock exactly. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Was the yeah. payday massive for this? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Um, working outdoors, a, a really big variable. It's not fun. Yeah. No, it's not fun because you you don't. Feel the people. What what you got to realize when you work outdoors is, it's not the same thing. It's like, it's like working in Japan. You don't hear the people. You're like they're sitting on their hands. They react differently. What you got to do is just kind of go through the motions. And he, it's kind of a freebie. Yeah. Because you're not coming back, you know. Right. So there's not going to be any angles being right, continued. Right. Or anything. It's just a freebie. I'm sorry, but Buddy is just his own worst enemy. I mean, that thing could have done, he could have done just so many things. So they, honestly, he was talented of the yin yang. I mean, he really was. He's a heat getting guy, bar none, and, and it could really work. But I think that uh, Rick just wasn't, wasn't happy with, with any of it. Uh, maybe was a little insulted by part of it. You know, I don't know that to be true, but I'm just imagining because, uh, you know, Rick would work with anybody. So if it, the kibosh got put to it quickly, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is some reference you talked about here, but I mean, they were going to take Baby Doll and put her with Buddy. Mm -hmm. He because uh, Tully got tired of it and he wanted out of it, and and she was obviously a factor at this point in time, mm -hmm. and, and he was going to get the opportunity, and that would have taken him to the moon because the way he would have played that would have been insane. Because he'd have played off everything, all that he could have got out of it, and he would have taken him to a completely different genre. But you know, he he self-destructed before that could happen. They think that they can create anything, and I think, you know, they could grab a guy off the street with no experience, put him in a school, teach him a few bumps, and then make make him draw a lot of money. It doesn't go that way. It, I'm talking guys that draw money are guys that's been up and down the road ten years and. You, you got to have that, and that's a prime example. You just can't throw. But I mean, they really thought they could do this. What was that's he why like? I got disgusted with the business. What was he like outside the ring? I I think he was a nice fellow. I mean, I heard some crazy things where he tore up a few hotel rooms, but I mean, we've all done that. Well, I haven't. <laughs> Um, when you see a guy like this where they're investing a lot of TV time and they did a bunch of promos leading up to his jumping out of a plane and all this mm -hmm. stuff and um, and maybe you see the work in the ring and everyone goes oh geez and it's not working is there anybody veterans on the roster that of their own volition kind of take the kid aside and say listen let me work with you here for a little bit well if I was going to do an angle with a kid I would definitely I kind of, you know, I'm from old school where I would help guys if they asked for the help, 
or I would help guys if I was working with them, I was instrumental in it. But you're so busy just trying to keep your own head above water, um, why would you go around and give somebody uh, you know, that, that time and effort? There's a lot of effort trying to teach somebody how to work. Mm -hmm. I think I might have said a few things to him, but you either got it or you don't, and I, I never thought he had it. What about, what's the, what, the decision of having Houston go over Arn? We were giving, we were trying to give him a push, you know, again, the youth thing. Give him, a, give him a little push. We, a matter of fact, we were getting him to use the belly to belly. I was, I was, you know, supposedly like mentoring him and showing him how to use the belly to belly suplex, mm -hmm. which was my finish. And uh, he was just being given, a, it, was, it was to not make a main eventer out of him, but put him where he'd be somebody good in the middle of the card to give him some uh, believability. Mm -hmm. And he was working out hard. I mean, he he was he was a, he had great potential what he what he could have done. Uh, so it, you know, it wasn't. I don't think he was ever being groomed for main event status. But somebody that'd be you had to be a main event status person pretty much just be on our cards. Because you know, face it, Arn Arn could have been in an opening match on on any of our cards and. Uh, and it had been a main event somewhere else. Was he well liked? Now he gets a little heat hooking he up get, with Nick Lowe he, he, here. Well, he, he would get heat because of what he did outside the ring. He would he he he, he wasn't the he what he was not the be, he didn't hold his liquor the best. Maybe that's the right way to say it. And what he did, you know, nobody has a whole lot of uh, babysitting skills for obnoxious drunks. So, you know, we all, you know, drinking was kind of a staple to the back of the day. But if you, if you were, if you could kind of set your watch by not wanting to be around that person, if they'd had one too many, then that kind of probably didn't put you on the best ground with the boys. And then you add to that, uh, he was kind of believing a little bit of his own PR maybe because he was getting a little push and it might have been perceived by others that he was being a little you know, too uh, cocky about it and whatnot. And again, like I said, then he ends up in a romance with Baby Doll that leads to, you know, them being together. And it kind of blew both of them up is what happened. Right. Were you on the show? No. It was really a ethnic thing. They had a black man, a Mexican, a, a Japanese guy. A sheik. Uh, uh, yeah, it was really, they, that's why they picked it that way. They had their blonde Hulk Hogan. Well, yeah, I was going to say the blonde thing. That's gone. Um, but at this time, in, in general, we got the cartoon, but now lunch boxes. notebooks, anything you could think of had a WWF -E stamp on it and your faces on it. Royalties are now starting to come into play in professional wrestling. Um, are you guys seeing that action right away, or is this something you guys had to fight for? Well, I was number seven on the dog action figures. That I call them still call them dogs. Mm -hmm. Action figures. Mine was the seventh one out, and I remember I went in to talk to Vince about something about a payoff or something I didn't like, or I don't know what it was, but. I just was having a, used to have a meeting just to try to stay, you know, abreast of what's going on. And he goes, oh, by the way, uh, you got a check here for $80,000. I go, $80,000? Yeah, for your first action figure check. You know, and right away I see that and I'm gone, I'm happy. I forgot why I was No complaints, in, huh? I forgot why I was in there to complain about. <laughs> so it was very, it was a good ride for a while. Do you guys have any input on what kind of products are going to come out, whether you're going to be on a thermos or, or Tampax? I mean, do you have any say on where your face shows up? Well, being a villain, you didn't have all that many things, you know, but, uh, um, you know, now we're, we're pretty much part of everything. Now I guess it doesn't really matter, but Hogan got most of all that stuff.
Is this the start of a scheduled push for Rocky? Them jumping him? Or is it just something? I, th I, think, it was, I think it was just a swerve and another, right. you know, another thing to try to distract you know, from something else they were planning on doing somewhere else. Was there, were they playing on a touch of the perhaps racist undertones of the rich white kids smacking around the... Uh... You know, it, it's, it's not real telling because, I mean, Dusty was always looking for somebody that might have been passed over and, and he's seen something in them that someone else didn't. I mean, uh, the big boss man was a job guy, you know, for us and getting ready to do a job on TV that I think that he did that we pulled off the tape because we realized that that's where Big Bubba Rogers came from. You know, the same thing with Mr. Hughes. And so it's not to say that that, that might not have been a possibility, because it certainly could have, because mm -hmm. it had happened, happened with other people. And he had a great physique. He was just mm -hmm. a smaller guy, but I mean, as far as his athletic ability and his work ability, he could have, you know, he could have certainly done all kinds of things if given the right opportunity. I don't know that he. I don't think he had quite the chops for the speaking part of it. Right. But uh, but as far as physically, man, he looked a million bucks. What is your favorite Haku is tough story? Oh yeah, in the bar in New Jersey, he took somebody's eyeball out, and he repeated that. In uh, Dayton, Ohio, we used to stay at the Holiday Inn right up from the O'Hara Arena, right near the airport. There was a bar underneath in a basement, and he took Jimmy Jack Funk's eye out there, too, so he, he liked to take those eyeballs out, you know. He was one tough guy. I heard that all the fights he got into, though, like with the Marks, the general fan or whatever, like there would be some somebody like uh, I'll just say me sitting there and then you got Haku sitting there or Tonga or whatever you want to call him. Mm -hmm. They would pick on him instead of me. Now that made no sense because you know. Well they didn't know. Yeah. You know, they, they look, what do you look at that ugly? I mean they would knock this guy and this guy is probably the the or one of the toughest guys in the business. The two participants have a combined age of 119 yes, years old at this point. That's September 20th. Were you here for this? No. I don't even remember that. You don't even remember it, okay. I don't remember the bad stuff. I couldn't imagine what this was like. What's the finish? Do I have it here? <laughs> a, disqualif a disqualification finish. Okay. I bet you the... Tied him up to the cage and just walked out. Tied who? Who tied who? Dick Albano tied Glassy to the cage and like, broke <laughs> And him. left? And then just walked out of the door. <laughs> That's so Lou Albano, isn't it? It's like you take two turtles and put them on their back and put them in the <laughs> ring. That's, they could probably have a better match. We didn't have a lot of managers in the South, hardly. You didn't see that only in New York. I think Vince, the old man, would bring guys in that couldn't, couldn't really do an interview, or he didn't give them a chance to do an interview, and he'd put them with somebody who was already over, like the Grand Wizard or Blassie, and let them spill their guts out about this guy, and the guy would just stand there like this. And But in the long run, you really don't get over. People like to hear that wrestler say a few words anyway. Mm -hmm. First of all, who calls this match? Rick called every one of our matches, mm -hmm. period. I mean, respect, you know, I'm, I'm in the business five years, he's the world's champion, I, you know, I'm not calling a match, no. Now, he didn't call my comeback or, you know, he would call spots. Right. You know, when, when it was time for a comeback or me to be the aggressor, uh, you know, he took the bumps I gave him. I didn't have to say, oh, you're, you're doing, I mean, he just knew that's right. the way it worked. Uh, so, 
and he would feed you things that you wouldn't even think of. But it's kind of you kind of get just so used to each other that it's just more like a dance, and you kind of anticipating what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, he'd certainly set the tempo and, and, and lead the match for sure. Well, I don't think that you don't want him to work as good as me, but you know, Randy, uh, <laughs> that sounds like my ego coming out, but I mean, everybody has their own style and uh, you don't really want to say, well, Randy Savage can work better than me, but I saw a lot of, a lot of unique things the guy could do. He was definitely a good athlete, and um, you know, this was really his chance, his first hurrah at working at this kind of level in front of thousands of people, the big stage of the WWF, and I and Randy handled it well, mm -hmm. you know, because he had that, he paid his dues. So that's there's another thing, a ten years are riding in cars and working these shitty little shows and, and that, that's all part of learning the business and, and paying your dues. Of all the guys that have come back through the years to their home base that was the WWE for a long time, either in a legends capacity or even new dolls of those guys from back then, why is Savage never used? Is there something that exists between he and Vince that you know, dates back a million years that we don't know about? Well, um, we go back to the strange, strange Lanny Popple, and then there's a strange part of Randy Savage. He, um, I just found out the other day that he lives about three blocks from me. Uh, he used to live down on Treasure Island in a condo. He had the whole top floor. And I found out he lives about three blocks from me, and he lives in a house, and it's a gated, gated house. Not the community, just the house is gated up. And I haven't seen the guy in four or five years. He's just real, I don't know what's going on with him. He real, real private guy. I, I thought when I saw this Randy Savage DVD come out that he might have made an agreement with Vince. But apparently Vince has got the rights to those anyway, so he just put it out. I know that Randy will get royalties from it. But, right. Uh, I thought maybe Randy was coming out of the, out of his, uh, out of his, uh, whatever, his hiding. But yeah. Uh, he, he's just a different type of uh, guy. The event stems from the Pro Wrestling USA attempt, which was the opposition attempt uh, against Vince, where uh, Jerry Jarrett and Crockett and Vern agree to kind of get together, start running the Meadowlands up in New York. Talk about that effort. It's an ill-fated effort because you can't have promoters with those egos agreeing to do things equally. Well, you could, and they made just Buku's promises about how they were going to divvy up the revenues. Right. And that was a big thing. Uh, it, I mean, this was huge. Comiskey Park, and this was yeah. a big house. Flair and I are the main event. Uh, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but the payoff was about 25% of what it was, had been forecasted to be when the deal was set up. So... We don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that nobody wanted to go re-sign up for that. I mean, we went up there and tore the house down and did what we what we do, but you don't go back for seconds when somebody does that to you. Right. Did you know instantly when you heard that all these promoters were going to attempt to work together that this was not going to make it? I gave everybody the benefit of the doubt the first time. I, I'd give anybody, I, I, you know, anybody once I give you the chance to show me what it is you're going to do and is it going to be real and then... We'll go from there, but again, you know, you once you've pretty much drawn that line in the sand, I'm out. I can't say anything bad about him, Terry. Uh, I've known him for years. He was down in Florida. Um, funny guy. He was a real funny guy, and I. 
he's passed away. Um, there's, there's kind of a mystique about him, you know. Well, it's said that he was much more upfront and in your face with his lifestyle than others that were maybe more private about their lifestyle. Right. He just kind of let it all hang out, no pun intended. He was a nice fellow. He did, yeah, I kind of like that. You know, I don't know. I never looked at his deal hanging out, but no. <laughs> but I'm in this. His <laughs> his uh, his uh, trysts, his uh, escapades, whatever. Um, something that, in retrospect, when we see old broadcasts now from the '80s uh, in Madison Square Garden, and you have. Uh, a guy like Jim Powers in the ring, I think it was, or Paul Roma, one I saw recently, and you got Gorilla on the microphone with either Al Hayes or Oakland, whoever it is, and you hear, well, I understand that uh, Terry Garvin and Pat Patterson both had a piece of this young man's contract. It's hilarious now. Were you guys laughing at that shit back then, yeah. to hearing it on TV? And Yeah, I just now remember you, when you mentioned yeah. it, I remember they would throw out little, little things like that. And, and, it was an in-house joke, so to speak, you know. But were guys like Pat, were they able to laugh at that shit too? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Flair was both a baby face and a heel in, in, in 85. Um, yeah, just depending on who he was working with. Yeah. Totally. You, what, what do you think he was better as? Oh, much better as a heel. Okay. Much better as a heel. Because he knew how to get the heat, and and he always had, and he had no problem being a cowardly heel when when it th when things turned around, he had no problem whatsoever doing that and doing it well. Mm -hmm. As a baby face, it became comical kind of. It wasn't serious, blood and guts and gore kind of comeback baby face. It became more to me kind of sillier, where he was much more believable to me as a heel. Was she smartened up to, that all this stuff is going to basically disintegrate her legit wedding? Gee, I, I don't know, but I know she got clocked with a, a bottle right in the head, and she didn't sell it, you know, which was good, you know? <laughs> exactly. Uh, she, I never got a chance to speak to her that much, but um, God, who'd want to marry Uncle Elmer, though? Ooh. Maybe she was... She'd have to be nearsighted or foresighted or blind. Yeah, there's some real logistical questions you could... You know, I think actually Jesse was alluding to many of them on the commentary about the wedding night on the NBC commentary. Tiny Tim in attendance for it. Yeah. Bit of a character. Yeah, Falls maybe party. into the Lanny Poffo Strange category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him in Chicago not, not too long before he passed away. He was just tripping along there and I... I introduced myself and he didn't even remember me. Um, then he died about a month later. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was in Definitely the his own world. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger coming into the dressing room and talking to Andre. He's really the only guy he really talked to in there. And, um, and they sounded exactly the same, their accents. <laughs> it was <laughs> like an echo, you know. His, his father uh, was Jeff Ports from England, hell of a nice guy, good wrestler. The kid, um, I think his downfall was, was he, he got married to uh, Ric Flair's ex-wife's sister, kind of, and I don't think the kid really had a shot. I mean, he had a shot of being a preliminary. It was awkward because I knew that her and uh, Sam were in this new torrid relationship. 
And they didn't, nobody smartened me up we were going to do this. Oh, and, really? Yeah, like, you know, like literally just a little bit before they said, okay, we did the do, we do, oh, by the way, you kissed baby doll. And and I'm going, well, wait a minute. This is Dusty yeah, Town. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm I, I, I not sure who, I, it had to be Dusty. I wouldn't even listen to anybody else tell me that silly stuff. But, but you know, I, I didn't get a lot of heads up to like really think it through a lot other than the fact my radar went off immediately. I said, man, Sam's just going to be pissed. And I said, but, you know, I'm not going to kiss anybody on television and look like I'm not the boss, right? <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I'm sorry, you want to jump up to this league and here you go. So, so we did, and we went for it, and, and, uh, and it was, I mean, Tully was awesome, man. He came, when he came and dove on me on that set, I mean, it was like, I didn't play football, but Tully did. Was it as stiff as it looked? That was it was thing. flipping awesome, man. He hit me like, he felt like he was going 25 miles an hour. I mean, he, he knocked me just skedaddled, man, like we were in a heap. And, uh, it, but it was almost comical to me because I was like, you know, I'm glad he did, and I'm glad it got over the way it did, but I'm like, I don't think anybody in their right mind thought that there was a romantic relationship going on between Tully and Baby Doll, even though it was a heel thing, or whatever. There was never any, like, sexual tension between them or any anything that showed, like, they had some deviant, passionate thing right. going on. It was like it was just a business deal. So for, for him to, he hit me like... This was his wife of 15 years, and 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 all that kind of stuff, and bam, and it was it was like it was magic, it it it, it took it took the tempo up, yeah. It was awkward because I knew that her and uh, Sam were in this you new know, toward relationship. And they didn't, nobody smartened me up we were going to do this. Oh, and, really? Yeah, like, you know, like literally just a little bit before they said, okay, we did the do, we do, oh, by the way, you kissed baby doll. And and I'm going, well, wait a minute. This is Dusty yeah, Town. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure who, I, it had to be Dusty. I wouldn't even listen to anybody else tell me that silly stuff. But, but you know, I, I didn't get a lot of heads up to like really think it through a lot, other than the fact my radar went off immediately. I said, "Man, Sam's just going to be pissed." And I said, "But you know, I'm not going to kiss anybody on television and look like I'm not the boss, right? <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I'm sorry, you want to jump up to this league and here you go." So, so we did, and we went for it, and and, uh, and it was. I mean, Tully was awesome, man. He came. When he came and dove on me on that set, I mean, it was like, I didn't play football until he did. Was it as stiff as it looked? That was it was thing. flipping awesome, man. He hit me like, he felt like he was going 25 miles an hour. I mean, he, he knocked me just skedaddled, man, like we were in a heap. And, uh, it, but it was almost comical to me because I was like, you know, I'm glad he did. And I'm glad it got over the way it did, but I'm like, I don't think anybody in their right mind thought that there was a romantic relationship going on between Tully and Baby Doll, even though it was a heel thing or whatever. There was never any like sexual tension between them or any anything that showed like they had some deviant, passionate thing right. going on. It was like it was just a business deal. So for, for him to, he hit me like this was his wife of 15 years and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And bam, and it was, it was like, it was magic. <laughs> It, 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 took, it took the tempo up, yeah. He's another guy who gets a, a tough guy uh, later. Oh, he was. Put on him, and I know he and Adonis had an incident, right? He, yeah, yeah, he pulverized Adonis. I remember coming, I was off that day because uh, I was sick, but I showed up in Chicago and Adrian was supposed to wrestle Hulk that night and his head was like this big around. I mean, I have never seen, I mean, it was like some, it was like uh, one of those guys with round heads on television. Um, <laughs> cartoons, cartoons, the South Park. Yeah, mm -hmm. looked like that. Huge, but all kinds of, I mean, he was getting ready to go out and wrestle. Hogan, I go, no, no, you can't go out like that, man. He looked terrible. And I never, you know, I, Danny, 
you know, Danny in a different situation, trying to come in and take Barry Wyndham's place was hard to do. If he came in like a heel or his own deal, he may have got over, but it was just a bad spot for he to be in. But as far as being a tough guy, man, I'm telling you, and, and Adrian was a pretty tough guy, and he knew how to wrestle. And every time he went to leg dive, Danny, Danny just clocked him. And, and Adrian started it in the ring uh, by giving uh, uh, Danny a, a hard time and kept saying, come on, can't you do this, can't you do that? And, Finally, Danny just hauled off and nailed him in the ring. And then he went back and they got into the dressing room. Adrian said, what did you do that for? And he went to dive him and he, bam, he hit him again and bam. And it was horrible. Hulk Hogan was a good friend with Rick, and and I remember being in Japan about six months before that happened with Rick McGraw. He was a fine young guy, and he was, I think he was from the Carolinas, or mm -hmm. that's where he got his start. Yeah, it was really, really sad. What was the company reaction? This is not a time yet where... It was like the first time yeah. that somebody had drug overdosed, and... Uh, you know, the reaction was, it was an accident. Um, but everybody knew that uh, Rick was on, was on pills, because I remember, like I said, six months before, we'd, we'd all go out to eat someplace, and uh, they, you know, the sponsors would take us out in Japan, and, and before the meal, well, they'd always bring you the rice, and then they'd bring you the meal later, before the meal would get there, Rick's head would always already be in the rice like this, you know. So I go, oh, here we go again, and the sponsor would be looking at his head in the rice, and he just pass out with his head in the rice. Yeah. Six months later, someone should have had an intervention. But you know, a few weeks earlier, November second, nineteen eighty-five, uh, Piper tapes uh, a, uh, a particularly brutal match with. Rick, where Rick is stretchered out. Now this airs a week after he dies. Mm -hmm. So the schoolyard rumors were always that Piper killed McGraw. Did you ever get wind of any of that? No. It was just bad timing. They had done a thing where he was carted out after a squash. Were there big plans for Billy? I could never figure that out. I never did. I knew that there was history between Billy and Dusty, that he had been down in Florida for Dusty. I knew he was a guy that was, you know, built like a Greek god, had this great physique, uh, and had had like a little cult following and up in the Pacific Northwest and, yeah. and, and down in Florida. But, you know, I was pretty savvy with seeing somebody and feeling the charisma coming off of them. You could be, you couldn't be in a room with, with Flair and Dusty, and not feel the charisma and the way they interacted. Billy Jack was a super guy, like I say, he looked like a million bucks, but I, I, I didn't look at him as a in a competitive light so much as you know another great supporting cast mm. that we could have to the team, and 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 so it was. Yeah, we were in a six-man on TV with him and doing all kind of stuff, and it was like he came in out of nowhere and he kind of left out of nowhere. He kind of he was kind of in yeah. and out, and, and it never made a dent. Do you remember shooting the video? Yes, I sure do, because we were there from 10 in the morning till a.m. at night. And they couldn't get it right because of Meatloaf, who was on the drums, and and we we would all start you know throwing stuff around, and towards the end we'd go we'd go after Meatloaf, and he's supposed to be like you know oh my God all these wrestlers, well he'd be like this ready to hit us back you know and so they ah cut cut, and then she couldn't get his part right, and so finally they just 
I just spliced his together because I couldn't get it right. <laughs> it, it turned out to be good, but it was, well, what a long night. Did you see and this? we didn't even get paid for it. I was going to ask you, what kind of money is involved with this? No money. For the album? Royalties, maybe. Were you yeah. on the album? Yeah, I was on the album. So you got money from that, right? Yeah, but it's in royalties. You yeah. know? I mean, you can get paid. Oh, to show up, you mean? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so you must have thought it was a whole lot of silliness going on that day, I guess, right? It was, it was guy. actually, it was a lot of fun, but after a while, you know, we were all pretty much in 85, we were pretty much a, all of us were pretty much a happy family. Was that legit? Did somebody win in Rolls Royce that night? Or is this, again, well, they used know. to do that in Mid Atlantic, and what they do is they say, hey, "Do you need a car, a new car?" And go, "Yeah." Well, we'll give you this deal. Go down to Arnold Palmer. It was called Arnold Palmer Cadillac in Charlotte, and we'll set you up. You can buy a car and make payments, and then you can win it at the uh, at the deal. At the match, you know, so the, they'll take your car, but you already own the car, right? The fan would have to buy it. Yeah, that that was the deal. Now I don't know how they if did, this worked. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how this did up here, okay. but George Scott was the booker, so it's probably uh, his idea. Interesting. Because it's worked in Charlotte. I'd love to get to the bottom of that. <laughs> um, the uh, why wasn't there a second wrestling classic? Was this not a success? Uh, I guess because of the car thing, you know, and uh, nobody wanted to buy their own car, I guess. The title change, it's sometimes said, is a screw job um, because uh, Wendy wouldn't sign a renewal on her contract prior to the to the deal. There, did you know any of this going on at the time? Did you care? Well, I didn't really care because I'm, I'm not a fan of girl wrestling, but I liked Wendy, and uh, Mula always made me kiss her every time I saw her. Good for you. Because she loved my dad, but you know, I really. Um, I did hear there was, there was some tension with Wendy. I did hear that, yeah. It was the first mega match, you know, that, that I've ever been in. That the build up had we he had we had worked this angle for so long, the heat had built up to such a crescendo that I knew the match was just going to be insane, and you know, of course, you knew where we were going with the finish and everything. But it was so funny because I'd never been in a super show. I didn't have ring music. I didn't have this and that and the other. So, you know, nobody, and and and, and also, I'm the challenger and not the champion. Well, the rule of thumb was always the challenger always goes to the ring before the before the champion. Mm -hmm. Always doesn't matter whether you heel or babyface. And like I said, I'd never had an entrance. So we didn't have dress rehearsals and walkthroughs and all this right. stuff. They said, go stand over here and, you know, and, you know, you'll be first until he comes second. But tell me anything else. Well, man, the music, you know, the music starts playing, all stuff going on. Do I say anything? Man, I'm, I'm jacked to the moon. I'm ready to go. And I go through, I go through the crowd down the little deal with no escort, no nothing. Roll in, roll in the ring, and I'm in the ring on go time, ready to go, goosebumps. And it was like they went to go back to pick up the camera shot of me coming to the ring, and I'm already <laughs> over here. I'm gone. I'm there. It was like I came up out of the floor. And, uh, you know, and then Tully came to the ring, and, you know, history ensued. But it was uh, – we knew it would be the pinnacle of this just this brutal, brutal confrontation that we'd been building to for all these many months. And everybody there – just knew that one of us was going to get killed. It was going to be that bad that somebody was going to get beat to flippant death. And that was the picture on the end of the match that they wanted to portray was 
it came back to humanity. So I end up with a spike in my hand. He submitted, though he didn't say the words, I quit. Right. He said, yes, yes. Right. You know, they quit. You know, that's the, the thing. But I've got this thing in my hand, and they're like, what, is he going to drive that through his head? You know, what's going to happen? I've got it by the head, got a mother hand. I'm looking at him, look at the stick. And finally, it's like, you know, it comes down 20 notches, and I throw it down. I let him live. You know, I walk off the champion. But that, it had to have some kind of blow, some, something to take the steam up and to bring it back down into some reality where it didn't make sense. And it was just by happenstance that, that Baby Doll throws this wood chair over the top that when he breaks it, it produces the nastiest looking right. thing you've ever seen in your life. You know, it just, it, I mean, it wasn't gimmicked or anything. Right. It just, when he broke it, it came up with this big nasty splinter attached to a steel hinge. And uh, it was like the perfect weapon. Where uh, do you rank this match in your career? It's become very iconic, and it's probably one of the most asked about. Best thing I ever did. Yeah, huh? Would he say the same, you think, Tully? Were here? I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's hard because I don't want to put down anything else that meant so much. But there, you've got to somehow look at history and say, how can something have withstood the test of time get compared to things that have been done 30 years later and still be considered in the top 10 of all brutal matches mm -hmm. that have ever been, you can't ignore that many critics, you know? And I knew when we were doing it, something, it was magic. I could, I mean, I could feel it, that it was, uh, we were doing something unparalleled. But in the back of my mind, you know, the rest of the story is, Dusty had this vision of me getting on a jet and making it to Atlanta and being at the Omni on live on screen before that was over with. And we, we, we didn't do our homework real good on our time to figure out how long it was going to take me to get from building to the airport there, then from the airport to the building. It was, that's why we went on early. We were the semi-main event, and we went on like third match or something, and I didn't even... I mean, I didn't do anything but blow out of that building, pull my jeans on, yeah. and bust it at the airport. And I get there, of course, after it's all over. Yeah. But that the plan was, we had to have a bell helicopter sitting outside for me to, to make wait it. for you. Yeah, yeah to yeah. wait for me and just, pff, you know, been there in 15 minutes or something. Your take on what's come to be known as the dusty finish. Uh. The Brilliant, only thing I brilliance really, or, or, or cheap tactic? A little cheap okay. in that people deserve a little more than what they get out of that. And, and I also didn't agree with the fact that you, if you, you build somebody to, they can do this. And, and this is one thing, you know, I'll, I'll say for the WWE, they don't have a problem with somebody main event caliber, you know, having a guy tap out with a submission hold that has been established as a submit submission hold, no matter what the deal is, they bring that reality to the game. Whereas we go out of our way to, you know, make something devastating and then, you know, then we change a title with a small package. I mean, to me, that that part of the psychology that worked in the 60s and 70s should have gone away and we should have moved more to things that play into what we've gone into now with uh, MMA fighting in the UFC and things that people know bring that element of to me it would be magic you know you could have a match with all this entertainment all this stuff happens and then out of nowhere somebody wins a match with a straight out submission hold that they know straight up from everything they've seen this is what it is and nobody works it and it's not big and dramatic it's I got caught and they and everybody's going you know what? He got ticked off, and he decided he really won that title, and he smacked that on him, and he beat him mm. right then and there with a little amount of it. Gee, what a thought, you know? Mm. Now, all of a sudden, it's, you put the question back in their head. Yeah. Is it real or is it illusion? Is it the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain? Right? It'd be easy. Well, I just saw there's another buffoon. Um, muscle bound, usually muscle bound guys don't make 
great workers, you know, ass ultimate warrior. It's just something about when you got all these muscles, your brain doesn't work right for wrestling. I mean, you might go out and sell real estate like Ivan Pusky has and made a big fortune, but you know, it's just something about that muscle bound. I don't know, maybe, maybe nowadays it's not like that because I see different muscular guys uh, that can actually work pretty good, but usually it doesn't work. Talk about the bunkhouse stampede, Dusty's famous uh, creation. Did you like them, Jim? Yeah, I did like them because I like putting on the boots and the jeans and the ripped up shirts and the bandanas and just stomping mud holes in people. And it was fun. The, Though I will have to say there's a classic picture going around the internet of, of uh, from talking about bunkhouses, of Dusty, Dusty and I, Jerry Lawler, all coming back from a match. Dusty's all covered in blood. I'm all covered in blood. And Jerry looks like he's been at the popcorn stand. And I was like, you know, and this is after you know, a 25 minute match. And I'm, I'm thinking about myself, you know, this is pretty funny. But to that point, you know, they were fun because they were outrageous. And you knew when you went in there, you know, a guy's going to take his cowboy boot off and try to beat you over the head with it. And somebody's going to have, you know, pull out a piece of barbed wire. Or we're going to have this. We're going to have that. And it was a fun, just kind of steam blow off, kind of fun kind of deal. But, you know, something you do once a year and, and drive on. Well, little did I know at the time, um, they were going to eventually, Vince was kind of creating a round robin with the tag team, and they were eventually going to get those belts back. And um, I think it was, wasn't too long after that, we, we dropped them in Chicago in, um, in 86. So we're going into another year, but. Right. We went a couple places, and we didn't even have the tag belts anymore. It was just a dream team against Volkov and Sheik, or they could have maybe had the belts then. But we sold out, like Anaheim, a couple times. Everywhere they put that match, it would sell out, and, and we were the baby faces. And I understand that because Nikolai and, and everybody wants to see, you know, two guys or heels going against two other heels, especially they they were, you know, foreigners supposedly. Right. So, we, we we were box office with those guys. So that was that was kind of a thinking ahead thing for George Scott. He was a good booker. Well, that was '85. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot yeah. of memories. A lot of fun. A lot of. A lot money. of smoky hotel rooms. You know, I, I I wish I could be back there. I would have done it a little bit differently. I, w I would have stayed away from the smoke. And, and save more of my rubles, but uh, you know it was still you know I really don't have that many regrets. You know? It was it was a great great time. It was really the the emergence of wrestling, sort of what it's like today. I mean it's not really like that, but that was when it really really blossomed into what took off. Yeah, yeah took off exactly. Any resentment? You uh, you have a family at this time? Oh yeah, and but I had been brainwashed <laughs> into, you know, that's the fraternity we were in. I mean, they, you know, all the the promoters and all the old school guys and everything, that that's what that's what wrestling was. It was an escape for people, uh, special occasions for the holidays, just like people going on Thanksgiving evening or afternoon to a matinee movie or something, uh, it was the same difference. So I did, but I, I loved performing so much that uh, those occasions were always special no matter what. And it wasn't a good business for families, to be quite honest with you. Right. It just was not. You had to be, uh, even though the best of attitudes, you're, you have to be very self-centered 
to do what we did, no matter how dedicated you are to it. Any way you look at it, you're constantly looking at yourself, how to make your performance better, how to be a better performer, better this, better that, come up with better angles, do different things, and you're always thinking about the performance, the performance, the performance. And it's 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 a young man's game. It's not a real healthy pl place to be uh, psychologically or anything else, and it doesn't really play well to the real world right. because you get to play this superhero or super villain in a controlled environment. And in our day, there was, you know, people thought these were your real characters. So you pretty much portrayed that 24-7. And, you know, then if you wake up one day and you can't do that any longer, fitting in the real world is a little tough. So as we draw to a close, looking back at 1985, um, where do you, was this the height of your career? Was this a... Uh it was, it, I, no, it wasn't the height because, I mean, obviously my, my career was cut short, didn't reach its pinnacle, but the the biggest accomplishment of my career was still the best of seven series with Nikita that would come into 86 right. uh, up until, you know, uh, I had a short program with Jimmy Garvin before my crash that w could have been huge too. But But the pinnacle of my career was, being able to work a main event with Nikita and put both of us in a really good light and and capture everybody's imagination. And actually, we went like nine matches or something. It wasn't even seven because it worked out so well. Mm -hmm. And we were going out there having 30 and 45-minute matches yeah. and tearing the house down. And for Nick and I to go do that wasn't like me and Tully or me and Flair. This was him and I. And this was me being the general, me being the right. the seasoned guy. So that was the first time in my career that I really honestly saw the light where I said, you know what, I could do this. I could I could I could carry the banner. Well I thank you for taking the journey. Pleasure. And I thank you for watching.